afternoon and welcome to the May 25th board business meeting. Welcome to our board members, MCPS staff, and members of our community who are joining us here today in person and via live stream. Now let us begin the meeting by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will now call the roll to recognize the board members who are here and establish a quorum. Mr. Kim? Good afternoon, Arvind Kim, student member. Good afternoon, everyone. Lynn Harris, I use she, her pronouns. Good afternoon, Rebecca Smondrowski, District 2. Good afternoon, Brenda Wolf, District 5. Good afternoon, Buenas tardes, Grace Rivera Oven, District 1. Good afternoon, Julie Yang, District 3. Thank you. Now we, um, we're going to revise the agenda to move the new business item immediately after the financial literacy uh, discussion, which is item 7.1. Can I get a motion to um, amend the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous with those present. Can I get a motion to approve the revised agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous with those present. Thank you. We can move on to item number three on our, our agenda, human resources and development. Dr. McDaniel. Thank you, uh, President Silvestri, and good afternoon, everyone. We do have a number of appointments that we are bringing forward today. Um, and I will begin with the first. Uh, Mr. Seth P. Adams, as Associate Superintendent in the Office of Facilities Management in the Office of the Chief Operating Officer. Mr. Adams has been employed with Montgomery County Public Schools for 16 years as a Project Manager, Chief Mechanical Engineer, Director of the Division of Construction, and most recently as the Director of the Department of Facilities Management. Mr. Adams is excited about this opportunity to both build new as well as strengthen existing relationships with the various stakeholders throughout our county. He looks forward to continuing his service to our students, staff, and communities through a student-centered approach to operational excellence. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. <coughs> that is unanimous. Congratulations. Our next appointment is for Ms. Diana K. Wiles as the Associate Superintendent in the Office of Special Education in the Office of Chief Academic Officer and Deputy Superintendent. Ms. Wiles has been employed with MCPS for two and a half years as a supervisor and most recently as Acting Associate Superintendent in the Office of Special Education. She looks forward to continuing her work with the Office of Special Education in supporting the ad academic and social emotional well-being of students with disabilities. Shout outs to her mother Mary and brothers Gerald and Daryl Wiles for their constant support and love throughout her career. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Congratulations. Our next appointment is uh, Mrs. Jessica M. Blasick as Supervisor in the Division of Title I and Early Childhood Programs and Services in the Office of the Students Office of School Support and Well-Being in the Office of the Deputy Superintendent. <laughs> Mrs. Blasick is joined by her husband Joe and her sons Jackson and William. She has been employed with MCPS for 20 years as a teacher, consulting teacher, staff development teacher, assistant principal, principal intern, acting principal, assistant principal, and most recently <laughs> as coordinator in the Division of Early Childhood. She looks forward to continuing to serve our students, staff, and communities through the development and implementation of the operating budget and the equitable distribution of resources. Shout out to her mentors in advancing equity in early childhood education, Mrs. Verna Washington and Ms. Nichelle Owens. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Congratulations. Okay, the next appointment bringing, being brought forward is for 
Ms. Devana T. Holmes as Supervisor in the Department of Special Education in the Office of Special Education in the Office of the Chief Academic Officer and Deputy Superintendent. Ms. Holmes is joined by her mother, Michelle, her father, and children, Hope and Bishop, and the best motivators on the planet. Ms. Holmes has been employed with MCPS for three years as a specialist and most recently as assistant school administrator at Clarksburg Elementary School. She looks forward to joining the Department of Special Education Services to support our schools, students, and families as they work together to create the most equitable conditions possible for students with disabilities. Shout out to her mentors and friend, Dr. Rotunda Floyd Cooper, her biggest cheerleader, Ms. Kia Middleton Murphy, and her friends and family are watching online. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you and congratulations. Next appointment moving forward is appointment of Ms. Shante F. Spa as principal of Falls Mead Elementary School. Ms. Spa is joined by her husband, <laughs> Libran, daughters, Nia and Ava, father-in-law, John, her mentor, Sharon Kelly, and Dr. Inger, Inger Swimpson. Ms. Spa has been employed with MCPS for 14 years as a teacher, staff development teacher, assistant principal, and most recently as principal intern at Glen Allen Elementary School. She is honored to work alongside students, families, and staff in supporting all students in their academic excellence and well-being. She is committed to fostering a sense of community and belonging at Falls Mill Elementary School. A shout out to her parents, Donald and Angela, her sister, Tamika, brother Donald, and all of her family from the Rocket City. <laughs> move, move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you and congratulations. Our final appointment is appointment of Mr. Stephen Peter Young as principal of Wingate Elementary School. And he is joining us virtually from South Africa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I would get that response. Mr. Young comes to MCPS with more than 21 years of elementary education experience. Mr. Young is humbled and excited to serve the Wingate community as its new principal. He believes strongly in engaging all stakeholders, including parents, staff, students, and community members in the decision-making process. He believes that together we can shape the future of our students and empower them to become the leaders and change makers of tomorrow. Move, move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that is unanimous. All right, that completes our appointments. Teacher check, principal check. So cute. These are the two additional public comments. Well, that's what I was saying. We should have some. Did we have some? So that eight people didn't show up. Okay. Excuse me. I missed that. All right. Moving on to our next agenda item, item number four. Recognitions, Dr. B. Knight. Thank you. Um, our first recognition is recognition of the Superintendent's Annual Mark Mann Excellence and Harmony Award. The Superintendent's Annual Mark Mann Excellence and Harmony Award was established in 1991 to honor the highest qualities and most significant accomplishments of the late Dr. Mark Mann, former principal of Parkland Junior High School. The award is presented annually to a Montgomery County Public Schools administrator who has shown exceptional performance in promoting academic excellence, positive human relations, and community outreach. 
Mrs. Carolyn Walselbin is the principal at Candlewood Elementary School, was chosen as the recipient of the 2023 Mark Mann Excellence and Harmony Award for her dedication to providing a challenging academic program for every student. Mrs. Walselbin is a compassionate leader who puts others before herself, creating a climate where staff and students always strive to do their best. She believes in each and every student's ability to succeed and ensures that every child is held to the highest standard both academically and socially. Mrs. Walselbin is a community builder committed to the success of everyone at Candlewood Elementary School. She knows each student and their family situation. She supports and celebrates the accomplishments of her staff and engages the community to create an inclusive together we are Candlewood strong family. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools, we congratulate Mrs. Carolyn Walsabin on her accomplishments and on receiving the 2023 Mark Mann Excellence and Harmony Award. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Our next recognition is recognition of Montgomery County Public Schools Higher Education Partnerships. MCPS celebrates its commitment, its commitment to partnering with local institutions of higher education in an effort to support aspiring educators and bring the best possible professional development and academic opportunities to our staff. MCPS recognizes and celebrates the more than 621 employees enrolled in the 10 institutions of higher education offering 20 partnership programs. Of these, more than 251 are 2022-23 higher education partnership degree and certificate program completers who have earned certificates, certifications, and bachelor's and master's degree. MCPS recognizes and celebrates the 34 certificate and eight master's degree graduates of the Hood College Educational Leadership Certificate and master's degree program. MCPS recognizes and celebrates the five students in the Bowie State University Continuing Education courses toward certification for conditioning licensed teacher program. This program supports conditional licensed teachers to move forward in their licensures. Whereas MCPS recognizes and celebrates the contributions of Bowie State, Hood College, John Hopkins University, McDaniel College, Montgomery College, Moreland University, Notre Dame of Maryland University, Towson University, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, University of Maryland, College Park, and University of Maryland Global Campus for the professional development of our support professionals, teachers, and administrators. Now, therefore, be it resolved that on behalf of the Superintendent of Schools and all Montgomery County Public Schools staff members, the members of the Board of Education congratulate and recognize our higher education partners and their graduates for their contributions to the school system and for creating a culture of lifelong learning and the pursuit of academic excellence. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Our final recognition is recognition of lesbian, <laughs> gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer pride month. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer pride month represent, present all of us with the opportunity to raise awareness of and peacefully protest issues that continue to face the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community. Respect and equity are two of MCPS's core values that embody its commitment to eliminating institutional barriers to student success and ensuring equitable practices across classrooms and workplaces in an effort to serve, support, and include all students. This year, 2023, marks the 53rd anniversary of the first Pride Parade, which was held on June 28, 1970, to commemorate the 1969 Stonewall Riots. The event is considered to be the birth of the modern lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer movement. The school system stands by the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and, queer, transgender, and queer community and supports their experiences in a proactive manner during current times where many states have passed or considering legislation that would severely limit lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer youth accessibility, preventing the use of locker rooms and restrooms consistent with their gender identity, blocking transgender youth from the specified sports, banning books with the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer representation, and limiting one's ability to use chosen names and pronouns in schools. 
The Pride Alliance has been developed as a collaborative stakeholder group, including staff, students, and families entrusted to implement a comprehensive district-wide action plan that aligns the vision, actions, and interests of our students, staff, and community with all aspects of the work involving LGBTQ plus and gender identity. The MCPS staff members, teachers, specialists, administrators, and support professionals are annually trained and work to create a supportive, inclusive environment that serves all students and families with care, compassion, and professionalism. In acknowledgement of LGBTQ plus identities, we take time to celebrate that MCPS is committed to a safe and inclusive school environment where all students are engaged in learning with appropriate instructional materials and are active participants in the school community where they feel accepted and valued. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools hereby declare the month of June 2023 to be recognized as the annual observance of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer pride month in MCPS. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. <coughs> Thank you. And I understand there is also um, acknowledgement. We do have some of our uh, Rockville students and staff here in the building today um, to be acknowledged around their literary work. Yeah, thank you very much. So excitingly, we have a new student publication in MCPS. This was started this year by uh, in a partnership with students from Rockville and Richard Montgomery High Schools and Earl Wood, Robert Frost, and Julius West Middle Schools. And this is the first edition. It's the students came early today and have been distributing it throughout the building. And here we have one of their advisors, Miss McKim. Hello. And we have <laughs> we have their uh, editor in chief, Duwanga um, Mayarada. Oh, the editor-in-chief. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You've just got a promotion. <laughs> you have two now. Anyway, um, and, uh, and then um, uh, we have Nicholas Vasquez, Anchi Purohit, uh, that are section editors, along with Dewanga Mayurata, and then their editor-in-chief is uh, Malak McDonald. And so i um, just thrilled to see them here today. And then um, also, he, yeah, John Marshall from Print Graphics is here, who... Um, just really supported these students every step of the way and helped them create just a really, really lovely publication, which mm -hmm. I uh, cannot wait to read. So thank you guys for being here today, and congratulations. Congratulations. I just wanted to make sure that we uh, acknowledge any other sponsors that were here. I understand we have Don Bowman, media specialist at Earl B. Wood Middle School, uh, Sarah Kahn, a teacher at Julius West, uh, Middle School, Jennifer Kidd, a teacher at Richard Montgomery High School, Krista McKim, teacher at Rockville High School, and Charmian Redden, a teacher at Robert Frost Middle School. Thank, you. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. President Sylvester, would you mind if I uh, just quickly acknowledge um, Dr. Susan Marks is in the audience today. This will be her last um, board meeting. So she has been with us uh, since last August and has filled in admirably um, and it just exceeded all expectations. And we are so grateful and thankful for all of the hard work that she has done leading the uh, Office of Human Resources and Development. We're very excited to welcome uh, our incoming chief, April Key. Uh, she will be here for the next board meeting, but I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge Dr. Marks and it is her birthday. <laughs> Well, our next agenda item is public comments. Public comments is one of our opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. This is a public meeting, and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper etiquette. Inappropriate personal remarks, rude retorts, and other such behavior is out of order and will not be tolerated. Those who demonstrate disruptive or disrespectful behavior during public comments may be asked to leave the room. 
Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, and work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. Today, we have 17 people who signed up to provide in-person test in testimony. Each speaker will receive two minutes for comments. When your name is called, please approach the table, speak clearly and directly into the microphone. 30 seconds prior to the expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signals that your time has expired. Please push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Push the same button once more at the sound of the buzzer to turn it off. In addition to our in-person speakers today, we have three people signed up to provide video testimony. We will play these submissions once the in-person testimonies have concluded. Copies of testimonies can be found on board docs where they are posted with other materials for this meeting. If we could have our first three speakers please come to the table, Sami Saeed, Sarah Rovner, and Nestor Fabrice Lugo. Mr. Saeed, you can begin. Good afternoon, Board of Education members and Dr. McKnight. My name is Sammy Saeed, and I'm the student member of the board elect for the 2023 to 2024 school year. I was initially going to voice my support for a one semester financial literacy graduation requirement, which I still support. Though, now I feel it'd be more fitting to comment on the contentious circumstances surrounding today's board meeting and MCPS's decision to eliminate the opt-out option for lessons including books about LGBTQ plus topics, most notably at the elementary school level. I first want to say, as a student representative who voices the opinions and views of the student population here in MCPS, there is overwhelming support for this measure. LGBTQ plus students have consistently expressed their desire to be represented in our curriculum, and the introduction of these these new books which cannot be opted out of uplifts and acknowledges the identity of these students. Just think about how much it harms students whose identity does not reflect the conventional standards if their classmates are not present when reading books that represent them. It is clear that opting out of these lessons would make these students feel out of place and can negatively impact their mental health and the development of their identity, as well as increase the likelihood of transphobia or homophobia in students who do not receive these critical lessons. I believe that there are always turning points in history in which society takes a step forward in the direction of progressivism. At one point, religious beliefs conflicted with schools' teaching of evolution, though we have now established that those claims are unfounded. And I believe today is no different as we take a step in the direction of a more inclusive and accommodating curriculum for students. I would simply like to express to the board that there is a vast amount of support, specifically student support, to maintain MCPS's decision to eliminate the opt-out option, even in the face of dissent. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Dr. McKnight, members of the board. My name is Sarah Rovner. I'm a sophomore at Albert Einstein High School, and I'm one of the captains of next year's girls varsity tennis team. I'm here today because of the current plans to construct a portable classroom on top of the Einstein tennis courts. This plan is not simply an easy solution for an overcrowded school. It is a smack in the face to Einstein's tennis family. This project treats tennis as though it were less important, a less worthy sport. I doubt that there was any discussion of removing part of the baseball field to make room for portables. I doubt you considered taking away a chunk of the soccer pitch because those are more important sports than tennis. You thought no one would notice and no one would care if you demolished a place that 37 Einstein students find solace at every spring. Are we so invisible in the eyes of our community, our team which has more than doubled in size in the last year? Are we so disposable, we who delivered hundreds of bags of mulch for Einstein Athletics fundraiser? Are we so insignificant, we who garnered over 700 signatures on our petition to save our courts? The answer is no, we are not. We are a close-knit, diverse team. Tennis is an accessible sport which requires little money or equipment. On our team, players don't need previous experience to join. Taking away space would prevent us from further growing our program. Our team is not something that you can shove aside to clear the way. We will not sit idly by and watch as our second home, our haven, is downsized to make room for a convenient quick fix. So if you thought we would be silent, that we would not object to this plan which labels our family as irrelevant and unnecessary, you are sorely mistaken. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fabrice Lugo? 
Good afternoon, uh, Dr. McKnight and the rest of the Board of Education. Um, as a freshman at Albert Einstein High School, the tennis team has, a, has been a very special place for me. And the tennis team has allowed me to thrive in my first year of high school as a super inclusive space for everyone. The team welcomed me and served as a place for me to decompress and have fun both at practices and games. The plan to put portables on the tennis courts will have devastating consequences on the tennis team. With over 35 people on the boys and girls tennis team, taking away a court will, would make practices even more crowded than they already are. Also, matches would be roughly twice as long without full seven courts. A critical part and other students' social life will also suffer tremendously because of the decision to take over the tennis courts with portables. Thank you. If we could get our next three speakers to please come to the table. Nikita Bat, Edith Yang, and Kaden Undergar. Ms. Bat, you may begin. Hello, my name is Nikita Bott and I am a sophomore at Montgomery Blair High School. I'm testifying today to express my support for MCPS's recent inclusive book policies and urge MCPS to prioritize inclusivity in their curriculums. LGBTQ students are three times more likely to commit suicide than their straight peers and twice as likely to be bullied. However, it has been proven when there's LGBTQ plus inclusion in the curriculum, LGBTQ students feel safer, are bullied less, and have better mental health. In a country where LGBTQ plus people are constantly under threat from legislatures in dozens of states, it is crucial that MCP MCPS creates a safe place for them. Over half of Generation Z identifies as LGBTQ, but only 20% of schools taught positive representation of LGBTQ plus people to youth. Teaching children about different communities is essential to combating the ignorance and hatred LGBTQ plus youth face. MCPS has started to do their part in ensuring that schools are a safe space for LGBTQ students. For example, they've introduced LGBTQ plus books into their curriculums, especially in elementary school, as well as started piloting LGBTQ plus studies courses. And we appreciate their efforts. However, we need to do more. For example, almost none of the core texts in the 10th grade English curriculum feature LGBTQ plus characters. Additionally, almost none of the books approved for the middle school curriculum feature LGBTQ plus characters. It is crucial that there is more diverse and LGBTQ plus literature added to the curriculum and taught in MCPS schools. Teachers should be given training in order to teach these topics properly and students should be consulted in the creation of these materials. Please do not listen to the hate and ignorance that is being spread by people who do not support an inclusive curriculum. People who support these policies are perpetuating hatred, which has no place in our school system. Listen to us, the students, and we're telling you we want inclusive curriculums that rep represent the amazing diversity of our student body. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this important issue. Thank you. Ms. Yang? Good afternoon, honorable members of the Board of Education and Dr. McKnight. My name is Edith Yang, and I am a sophomore from Montgomery Blair High School. Today, I would like to address a commonly overlooked issue, the mental health of students in enrichment programs. I would like to a, state a disclaimer that this is not in favor of removing enrichment programs, but increasing support towards students in these programs. As a student from the Montgomery Blair High School Magnet Program, we are constantly reassured that mental health support is available. But our opinions are often met with indifference by the administration, not only making students shy away from seeking help, but also leaving students crying in the hallways and being sent home with panic attacks, unable to breathe. The administration often gives a response, saying that we have nothing to be stressed about if we already obtain high academic performance. Our efforts to maximize our academic potential are discredited, and our achievements are dismissed as results of privilege. Students in enrichment programs are assumed to have countless opportunities, yet what people fail to notice are the overcrowded buses, battered textbooks, and lack of funding. One way this undersupply of resources manifests itself is the bus shortages that force magnet students to remain in class during tornado warnings and bomb threats while other students are dismissed. This is not only a threat to our mental well-being, but also to our safety. To our Board of Education members, I would like to acknowledge that there has been significant progress made toward mental health awareness in the past few years. Yet mental health support is still mainly targeted toward those who are not performing proficiently in school, while students in enrichment programs are seen as leading privileged, worry-free lives. 
Addressing this issue requires more mental health support towards students in enrichment programs and tackling the root cause, the stereotypical view that Montgomery County Public Schools has of its students in enrichment programs. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Unger? Good afternoon, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. As captain of the Einstein Varsity Tennis Team, the plan to build additional portables on top of the tennis courts deeply concerns me. This plan raises issues of equity and sets a dangerous precedent for future portable placement. The board needs to ensure that overcrowding in the DCC schools is managed in a way that fairly distributes the burden. Adding portables at Einstein is only necessary because the distribution of students among different schools is unequal. Next year, Einstein is projected to be almost 500 students over capacity, while Kennedy is project projected to be just 63 over capacity. Why should Einstein and its, and its athletic programs take the brunt for inequitable distribution of the student population? The placement of the portables is also of concern to me. Though I appreciate that not all the courts are being taken away, the loss of even one court sets a precedent of prioritizing cheap solutions over students' physical and mental health. We are in the midst of a severe mental health crisis, and for many students, sports such as tennis are a way to decompress from the stresses they face. By continuing to choose athletic facilities to place portables, MCPS is severely damaging the mental health of students across the country. County, I mean, sorry. <coughs> Additionally, as Einstein becomes even more crowded in future years with Northwood's move, taking away one court now sets an example for similar solutions next time the school needs to place more portables. It may be just one court taken away this year, but then many more courts in the years to follow. Please do not do this. Thank you. Thank you. If we could get our next three speakers, please, to come forward. Jovi Lopez, Zainab Chaudhry, and Kareem Mounib. Mr. Lopez, you can begin. Good afternoon, President Silvestri. Uh, Vice President Evans, uh, Superintendent Dr. McKnight, and members of the board. Uh, I'm here today to deliver remarks on behalf of Jennifer Martin. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, talking about the new tentative agreement between MCEA and MCPS, which represents a remarkable accomplishment. Uh, it begins the work of rebuilding respect for the education profession by providing significant wage enhancements and improvements in our working conditions. Our union is pleased to share today that our membership, by a vote of 98% to 2%, ratified this agreement. This overwhelmingly favorable vote indicates the beginning of improved relations between our union and MCPS. On June 6, this board will do its part to ratify the agreement as well. We look forward to continuing to find common ground as we work together on behalf of this county's young people and families. Challenges await us. Today, the County Council finalized the budget for fiscal year 2024, presenting us all with the difficult task of finding ways to meet the needs of our students without having received full funding of the board's request. We are here to be your partner in striving to provide the excellent education all our students need and deserve. Like you, I priority will be to attract and retain highly qualified staff to fully support every student. The new contract is crucial to achieving this goal. Unfortunately, because of the council's decision to deny a, major, a major portion of your request, the school system will be relying on one-time funding sources to support ongoing operating expenses. This leaves us in an even more precarious situation in 2024 through 2025 school year. We recognize that there are powerful private interests influencing council members to serve our schools. We plan to stand with you starting now to ensure we don't find our students losing out again when a new budget is set next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sign of Chaudhry, you may begin. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight, board members. My name is Zainab Chaudhry. I'm the director of CARES office in Maryland. CARES is a council on American Islamic relations. We are the nation's largest Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization. I am testifying here today before you 
on after hearing from thousands of your community members who feel deeply dismayed and betrayed by the sudden recent move to revoke their right to be notified and opt their children out of lessons, programs, and content that can conf conflict with their sincerely held religious beliefs after initially promising and granting these reasonable religious accommodations. Community concerns are not simply rooted in int recently introduced books that conflict with faith values, but also accompanying classroom discussions and activities led by teachers who are figures of authority within your school system that aim to not just educate and raise awareness, but also actively promote values and ideals that conflict with sincerely held beliefs. Religious freedom is a hallmark of a pluralistic society. It must be defended in our schools at every cost. Public schools funded by tax dollars must not be in the business of exploiting their influence and power to violate constitutionally protected rights and freedoms. This is a copy of the Constitution that I hold in my hand. The alarming rise in hate bias within our schools is very troubling. It reflects a trend that my organization has observed in our line of work. Our civil rights report this year indicated a 63% rise in the number of school-related incidents reported in to us from uh, regarding attacks against Muslim children in 2022 versus 2021, including right here in Montgomery County Public Schools. Let me be clear, every child, regardless of their identity, is entitled to a safe learning environment, free from hate and intimidation. We are not against and opposed to that. Any decision you make when tackling hate bias must be made with the rights and well-being of every single student in mind. This promotes true safety and equity. It's unjust and counterproductive to assert inclusivity and tolerance for some by marginalizing and infringing on the rights of others. Yet that's precisely what is happening before our eyes. Our position is not that the books in question should be removed. Instead, we're urging you to respect the rights of families to have a say in when and how their children are exposed to content that contains sensitive content. Kareem Monif, you may begin. Dr. McKnight, board members, my name is Kareem Monib, representing the Coalition of Virtue, an organization advocating for Muslims in public schools. Today I am here to address our concerns regarding our children being influenced in ways that contradict their religious beliefs. Recently, MCPS made changes to its opt-out policy, disallowing Muslim children from being exempted from lessons that promote family structures or gender beliefs conflicting with Islam. While this may appear trivial to some, it is essential to understand the underlying principles of Islam that the MCPS board should consider. Firstly, Islam is a text-based religion. Our beliefs are derived from the Quran, a sacred book memorized in its original language by cultures worldwide. We also follow the authentic narrations of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. These foundational moral beliefs rooted in these sources cannot be altered. Muslims do not create their religion. Instead, we seek to understand and follow God's will as expressed in the Quran. Secondly, Islamic teachings regarding family structures and sexual norms have remained unanimous for over 1,400 years. While there may be varying opinions among scholars on various matters, there is no disagreement when it comes to sexual norms in Islam. Thirdly, in our religion, parents hold the moral and ethical responsibility for their children's upbringing. Neglecting their religious beliefs is considered an offense, and parents are liable for providing a good upbringing. The, the goals of inclusion are to affirm the student who is being included. We believe that, that that goal can still be achieved while allowing religious students or Muslim students to opt out. The, the student who is hearing their story being affirmed, that can still happen in the classroom. But to require and force the Muslim student to remain in the classroom, that is unfair. And that's what we are, would ask you to reconsider and, you. and allow. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we could get our next three speakers to please come forward. Hisham Garti, Saida Wasti, and Brian Lancaster. Is uh, Hisham Garti here? You may begin.
Good afternoon, Dr. Midnight and board members. My name is Donya Purnell, and I am a student of MCPS schools. I am here to testify and, incur and encourage you to allow students like me to opt out out of content and books that contain sensitive and mature con topics that go against my religious beliefs. However, this does not have anything to do with hate and bias against other groups. Everyone deserves respect. I personally choose to not have to sit in these uncomfortable discussions and shouldn't have to feel like we have no choice but to sit through these unsettling topics. It is important to be peaceful and respectful of everyone despite our differences. This means a creative space for everyone, including students like me. Thank you. Brian Lancaster. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm the parent of a Hi, I'm Brian. I'm the parent of a Poolsville High School student where they are currently undergoing construction while the school is being occupied. So far, construction is not going well. Let's start with the roofing. It's currently being heated to, the uh, tar is being heated to 500 degrees right next to the school building. It's, off, it's letting out gas in the form of pol uh, volatile organic co compounds that are absolutely getting into the school despite sealing efforts. It's, it, this is absolutely a risk to students and staff inside the building. Now let's talk about asbestos which is supposed to be, according to MCPS policy, something that uh, is not disposed of while students and staff are in the building. But if you look at my written testimony, included is an example of last year where that appears to have happened. Finally, we'll look at flame retardants, a class 1A uh, carcinogen that lets out silica when it get, has a nasty habit when it gets into the lungs it causes silicosis which is a debilitating and deadly disease. Instead of actually sealing off the where, where it's being done like the air intake into the school what's actually happening is they're relying on the air filtration system which just one month ago they said was inadequate and not providing uh and one of the main reasons that the construction's happening meanwhile our we we've responded to the school board and our so far uh, everything's been ignored that i'm aware of uh, we, we haven't gotten a response back to reasonable uh, suggestions for existing construction. Uh, other schools, th th this is also happening with, uh, and also the same thing. Uh, my suggestion is this, please respond to us. We're, we're reaching out to you guys and we're getting no response. And please don't, don't do this type of construction in the future. It's just not working. MCPS states that one of the main priorities is the security and safety of its students. Now, I have one, one thing to say to that that only students will understand, and that's CAP. Thank you. <clears throat> we could get our next three speakers to please come forward. Wael El Koshari, El Haji Sal, and Tamer Mahmoud. Wael El Koshari, you can go first. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. McKnight and distinguished members of the board. My name is Wael El I have lived in Montgomery County for most of my life. I attended Brown Station Elementary School, and I was the first graduating class of Quince Orchard High School Go Cougars. I'm here to request the immediate reinstatement of the opt-out option for students whose religious beliefs conflict with certain MCPS material, and to make sure these students are protected from bullying and abuse due to these beliefs. Montgomery County's highly diverse Wallet Hub recently published a study in April of 223 that found that Gaithersburg is the most diverse city in America, followed by Germantown, followed by Silver Spring, and Rockville is the 13th. This diverse population has entrusted you, the Board of Education, to set school policy that doesn't favor one group's needs over another's or limits freedoms that are set forth by law. The opt-out option was a fair approach it accommodated diverse ethnic, cultural, and religious student body at MCPS without compromising any portion of your curriculum. Maryland law states, the local school system shall establish policies, guidelines, and or procedures for student opt-outs regarding instructional related materials for family life and human sexuality objectives. The local school system shall provide an opportunity for parents 
and guardians to view instructional materials to be used in the teaching of family life and human sexuality objectives. Listen, I realize that my religion and my beliefs are not mainstream, and that we're a minority in this country. However, I stand by my God-given right and constitutional right to practice, promote, and raise my children based on those beliefs without fear of recrimination or routine relegation to second-class status. Peaceful coexistence hinges on the equitable distribution of recognition, of support, and protection to all groups, not a select group. We don't celebrate one group. I call on you, our trusted Board of Education, to protect us, the minority, and to protect our constitutional rights to practice our religion. And there are 200 people outside here today. Thank you. You may begin. Uh, dear Dr. McKnight, uh, board members, ladies and gentlemen, my name is El Haji Sal. I'm an imam, a religious leader in the Muslim community in Montgomery County. I'm also a parent of five children, of which three are all now in MCP schools. I live not far from here. Today, I'm urging MCPS to uphold the religious freedom of our students. Uh, respecting religious freedom means recognizing and accommodating the religious needs of our children. This includes honoring reasonable requests of religious observance, offering opt-out options for curriculum content that may conflict with religious belief, and promoting an atmosphere of understanding and acceptance. Uh, if parents are not allowed to opt out of any curricula, then their kids are being forced to accept ideas contrary to their belief that is against their First Amendment rights and against the well-established rights of parents to guide their children's education. Furthermore, to allow children to opt out does not discriminate against anyone or cause any hatred. This is a false argument. If simply allow, it's, it simply allows people to practice their long, held belief. There is no uh, good argument for not allowing students to opt out. An estimated about 10% of Montgomery County are Muslims. We, cont we contribute both students and teachers to the MCPS. There is a massive consensus, consensus in our community that M MCPS needs to reinstate the opt out and respect our religious freedom. The school should focus on academics. It is my belief that uh, restrictive policies such as the MCPS policy do not further that goal. Instead, they create an atmosphere of ideological imposition. Muslim students learn best when they do feel their religious views. Thank you very much. Sir. Dear Dr. McKnight and respected board members, my name is Tamar Mahmoud and I'm a Muslim parent of three MCPS students. I'm here to call for the reinstatement of the right of parents to opt their children out from instructional material that conflicts with their faith. Failure to do so has significant negative legal, social, and reputational implications. First, the legal. They take, taking away the opt-out option when such material conflicts with a child's faith violates our First Amendment rights to practice our faith freely without discrimination. Furthermore, <coughs> MCPS decision to void the opt-out option occurred without any notice or feedback, notice to or feedback from the patient, the parents. Second reason, social and student safety reasons. MCPS cannot preach tolerance and inclusivity for one community by practicing intolerance to another. Infringing on the rights of certain students will build an environment of hostility to our children who will feel inferior, unheard, with a significant impact on their mental, emotional safety and well-being when they are forced to violate their sincerely held religious belief. Third reason, reputational reasons. MCPS has prided itself on being a pioneer for instilling an inclusive and safe environment to all students. That's how my children felt, included and supported. Reinstating the opt-out option will allow this to continue. By voiding it, MCPS has changed this message and its tolerance towards Muslim families. Reinstating the opt-out option will neither alienate or discriminate against anyone. As Muslims, we are required by our faith to be respectful and honor all mankind. I ask you to read the Quranic verse in the written testimony 
our Creator has honored all humankind, regardless of race, gender, skin color, religion, or national origin. And so will we as Muslims. Thank you. Thank you. We could get our next three people to come forward, please. Brunilda Lugo de Fabriz, Binish Mustafa, and Chad Earl. Ms. Lugo de Fabriz, you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Brunilda Maris Lugo de Fabriz, and I am an Einstein High School parent, classes of 2021 and 2026. I am here to express our dismay at the reduction of our athletic field space particularly our tennis courts this year because of the expanded use of portable classrooms for the school. I particularly want to talk about the detrimental damage reduction of access to athletic space does to our student population. So my boys graduated from Sergeant Shriver Elementary School. Um, currently, that has an 86.9 farms rate and 53.4% EML rate. Then they went to Leiterman Middle School, which has a 62.4 farms and 32.1 EML rate. Year-round access to sport is critical to providing all students equitable access to skills and opportunities. As sport, such as tennis, particularly stands out because of the low level of economic investment required for access compared to other sports, namely racket, shoes, done. Um, no padding, no extra uh, shoot padding knees or shoulders or anything like that. For a community that draws from the kind of economic background as my son's elementary and middle school reflect, sports provides overwhelmingly positive social and health benefits, especially in this post-COVID recovery era. Come to Einstein any afternoon and you will discover all of our athletic fields filled to the brim with multiple teams literally trying not to run into the other students, teachers and parents while they play. As it is, the loss of that one tennis court will make it difficult for our full teams to practice and conduct their meets. What concerns us even more is the level of overpopulation that this indicates. Um, we already have 11 portables in a severely constrained geographic area. Clearly, we understand better than anyone the appeal of our amazing school has. But the level of overpopulation is detrimental to our teaching staff's ability to help all of our students. The loss of access to a full range of sports for our students will also be a negative side effect, since we have nowhere else to move our practices. As sad as I am to say, we may have to consider capping the lottery numbers for Einstein as a possibility. So, <clears throat> sorry, just as long as you can hear me. So good afternoon, Dr. McKnight and the Board of Education. What makes up the Montgomery County Public Schools? Beauty in all different forms, blacks, whites, browns, different shades of pink, big, small, tall, short, vegans and vegetarians, Christians and Jews, Muslims and Buddhists, Hindus and atheists, male, female, non-binary, transgender, queer, to each their own, but to each we love, respect, and tolerate. And to each we teach the importance of coexistence. And to each we will allow to practice what they want to practice, and to each we will show the courtesy to not interfere, step on, or discriminate against something they hold dear, to whom they love, to what they love, whether it be a person, a religion, a memoir, an ideology, let us not force the animal activists to dissect an animal in biology class. Let us not force the Native American to sit through the heroic traits of Christopher Columbus. Let us not force the devout Muslim, Christian, Jew, or Hindu to read books that go against their religious beliefs. I request that Montgomery County Public Schools reinstate their opt-out option for all parents. This is not a Muslim issue. This is to foster and respect the religious and moral values of parents. School administrators should allow opt-out option to curriculum offerings, especially when opt-out can be made without disrupting the school's overall mission. 
My name is Binish Mustafa. I am the proud mother of an autism spectrum disorder student at MCPS. My vision is to see my son live independently, a devout Muslim that is a contributing member to his diverse and rich community, a community that does not step on each other, but rather makes room. And though they may not agree on everything, they agree to mutually respect each other's right to practice what they want and to coexist. Thank you. Chad Earl. Chad Earl, you may begin. Uh, thank you, Dr. McKnight and the rest of the board. Uh, my name is Chad Earl. I'm the Director of, Isla uh, of Religious and Youth Affairs at the Islamic Center of Maryland. I wasn't planning to speak. Somehow my name got, got on the list of speakers today. Um, but I'm happy to be here uh, to speak on behalf of our uh, children and parents in MCPS. Um, as a religious community, the, um, Muslims put a lot of emphasis on our faith and, and centering our lives around our faith. Uh, amongst those um, issues that come up uh, as human beings are sexual ethics. This is something that we believe is faith-based. It's something that we teach our children when, when, when it's appropriate. And it's something that we would feel uncomfortable letting others talk to our children about. This is faith-centered. It's not uh, just about biology. It's not just about the birds and the bees. It's about our place in this world as believers and where we stand on these issues. And this is something which is very, very personal. And it's something which we want to introduce to our children in, in a way that's appropriate to our faith. And to ask other people, other parents, other uh, even teachers that are well-intentioned to speak to our children about these issues, uh, without understanding our perspective as believers would be very, very difficult, particularly in, in times that we're living in when the message that is being spread in the schools is uh, against our religion. It's against our religious teachings. So the opt-out uh, option is the best option. It's one that respects all communities and all um, uh, people of different perspectives, and it, wa it is one which honors our children and our parents' wishes. Thank you very much. received three video testimonies. First up is Tariq Latif. Please play the video. Hi, my name is Tariq Latif. I'm a Muslim and an immigrant who migrated to the U.S. at a very young age. Uh, I spent most of my childhood in Montgomery County attending MCPS public schools. I also have three young kids, two of whom attend Ronald McNair Elementary. My kids love their school, the teachers, the administrative staff, and the diverse student body. I have seen the school be inclusive of our culture and ethnicity, and it really makes us proud to send our kids to such a welcoming environment. As a practicing Muslim and a U.S. citizen, I firmly believe that all people have the right to live their lives as they choose and practice their religion as they see fit, and we instill this belief in our children. A fundamental tenet of our faith is that there is no compulsion in religion or beliefs and that every individual has a sovereign right to privacy and self-existence. The First Amendment forbids the states from prohibiting the free exercise of religion, and it allows the individual's practice of their own religion against restraint or invasion by the government. I'm here today representing myself and other parents that strongly believe that the recently added texts to the curriculum directly go against our Islamic principles and teachings. We are not asking for these books to be removed from the shelves or the curriculum. We're simply asking for you to reinstate our first First Amendment right to opt out. Literature often reflects different cultural, religious, and moral viewpoints. Some families may have specific religious or cultural beliefs that guide their preferences for what their children should read. We recognize that our moral code conflicts with the content in these books. We also acknowledge all individuals' constitutional right to live in peace and free from abuse. Our faith teaches us to be compassionate and empathetic towards all, regardless of race, gender, or identity. Nevertheless, we emphasize our God-given constitutional right to hold, live by, and promote our religious beliefs in the best manner without fear of legal reprisal or systemic marginalization. Peaceful coexistence does not necessitate agreement, acceptance, affirmation, promotion, or celebration. Our belief is firmly rooted in our religious texts, and we refuse the false choice between succumbing to social pressures to adopt views that are contrary to our beliefs or facing unfounded charges of bigotry. Such coercive ultimatums undermine prospects for harmonious coexistence. And so I invite you to have a dialogue with us and hear our perspective. This issue cannot be ignored, and it will not go away. We will be back at every public hearing until our voices are heard. Thank you. Next, next 
we will hear from Stephanie Pleasure. Please play the video. Hello, Board of Education and members of the MCPS community. My name is Stephanie Pleasure, and I'm a parent of four current MCPS students. My husband and I are both MCPS graduates. We believe in the power of public education to teach our children well and to keep them safe while at school. On Wednesday, May 10th, my son called me from the nurse's office at Parkland Middle School complaining of a headache and told me he felt very nauseous and that every time he took a breath, it felt like his airway was on fire. When I picked him up, he was very pale and definitely looked ill. I got an email from school notifying the Parkland community that the construction crew was applying a bituminous asphalt tar that day. Parkland had notified us that headaches, nausea, and other symptoms may accompany roofing work, but that it was non-toxic and completely safe. It's telling that just moments after we left the contaminated area, he felt better. Imagine if I were unable to pick up my child early, if my child had asthma or a respiratory illness and was exposed to these toxins for a longer period. As I started to research my son's symptoms and its usage in MCPS, I was even more appalled to discover that at Poolsville High School, there have been dozens of students sickened by bituminous asphalt tar on a daily basis since February. MCPS is aware of the danger of exposure to these toxins. In an MCPS document from May 22, 2022 regarding roof replacement, it's stated, roofs are replaced when schools are not in session and are scheduled during the summer. OSHA has also recognized the impact these fumes can have. This all sounds like the opposite of non-toxic and completely safe. I'm not a scientist, but I am a parent, and it's clear that these fumes can make our children sick. What I'm asking of the board today is to please plan roofing projects for when our students and staff are not in the building. I know that MCPS is committed to providing a safe space to learn in all ways. Everyone deserves access to clean air, and exposure to fumes and toxins violates that basic human right to the detriment of our children's health. This is not a project for a task force of tomorrow or an agenda item for future discussion. This is a basic human necessity, clean air. Please make immediate changes to the construction calendars right now and into the future to reflect a desire for equity and safety for our entire MCPS community. Thank you. Our final testimony comes from Raif Hagag. Please play the video. Hi, my name is Raif Hagag. I'm a lifelong resident of Montgomery County, Maryland. I went to MCPS as a kid, taught for nearly a decade as an MCPS high school teacher, and currently my daughter is attending the wonderful Dr. Ronald McNair Elementary School here in MCPS. Montgomery County is amazing, and I truly believe that our school system plays an important part in making this county an excellent place to live and raise a family. And one of the things that makes MCPS exceptional is the diverse student body and the families that choose to live here. The ethnic, religious, and cultural diversity is something that I have always been proud of and has truly made MCPS a gem of a school system, in my opinion. But today I'm sharing my concerns because I fear that this may no longer be the case for my children and future generations. I'm starting to notice and witness intolerance creeping in, discriminating against students and parents who wish to practice their sincerely held religious beliefs. I have heard from parents who have had their children bullied for observing their religion. Also, and, and this is really critical to why I'm here today, <coughs> the recent removal of the opt-out option for parents to protect their children from reading materials that contradicts our religious beliefs is a step too far. This removal of the opt-out option is wrong, it's unacceptable, and to be honest, it's quite embarrassing that MCPS is taking this right away from us, which runs in contradiction to MCPS's own tradition of fostering tolerance and acceptance. I urge you to reinstate the opt-out option and create a safe space for students to exercise their religious rights. Thank you for your attention. This concludes public comments. The next business meeting of the Board of Education for public comment is June 6, 2023. Sign-ups for public comment will open on Tuesday, May 30th at 6 p.m. In addition to the online sign-up for public comment, we allow for in-person, same-day sign-ups when space allows. Unallocated slots may be filled on a first-come, first-served basis on the day of the meeting. In order to sign up in person, please arrive 15 to 20 minutes before the start of the opening session and sign the form. In-person sign-ups will close 15 minutes before the public comment begins or when all slots are filled. Um, so at this moment, I will turn to my fellow board members to see if they have any comments or questions to the superintendent. If not, we can move on with the agenda. Ms. Yang. Um, I have uh, two questions. I know we heard a lot of uh, testimony today about the tennis court. So 
I would like to have some understanding about, um, you know, uh, you know, what the update of the situation. Maybe if we could have Mr. Um, Adam. Paul kind of follow up with that, yeah. uh, just to make sure that, do you want to, uh, uh, you oh, want to know what's going on? Oh, it, it, it can be another time to follow up with us so that, because we hear the community's concern, but I also wonder to know that, um, <coughs> you know, there are multiple tennis score at a school and every school have different capacity or different amount of tennis court. What's the norm out there? Are there other options that have we explored or other options? So an update will be good. And I would also like to ask um, Edith in her comment, Edith, um, uh, she has left and uh, understand that she mentioned something about bus shortages, doing bomb threats and weather shelter situations that those some student has to stay behind and and so I I wonder what that what that means. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Yang. I'll start with the first. So uh, I am appreciative that our Einstein students came out. It's always nice to hear that they are participating in extracurricular activities and have found community in those spaces. Um, I do know that you know we we have been working with Einstein Middle School, Einstein High School, and they will still have access to ten tennis courts and I mean six tennis courts. And as one of the students alluded to, one of the six um, is a part of the tennis court at Newport Mill the uh, middle school, which is right next to it. Um, most schools do have five courts. Um, when we think about why we looked at that as an option, trying to make it parable to other schools, and I know that it is difficult when it comes down to dealing with space, but I did want to share that perspective. But nonetheless, um, um, what I did gather from hearing from them today is that we will follow up and, and really work with them to have some more conversations to help them understand some of the parameters that we're trying to work around so that they can uh, just be a part of that discussion. Absolutely. And then the second part um, of the student, yes, who, who shared um, that concern, she also noted as one that I wanted to follow up to better understand exactly what the experience was. So I'll have uh, the staff, Mr. Hall, follow up with the student so that we can better understand that experience that she was referring to. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Rivett-Oven. Um, just wanted to, um, uh, to see if we can have an update on the TART situation. It is a health, it's seen, it's seen as, as a very um, worrisome health situation for a lot of parents. And I would like to add also for staff, um, uh, as someone who suffers from bronchial issues quite a bit uh, and asthma, uh, this, is, this is a concern. So I know that we were looking into it. I think there was, I don't know if we were getting some advice also from the health department, but I think it would be good to because I heard, I don't know if, if that parent's still in the audience. Mr. Lancaster. Mr. Lancaster, is he I think here? He is okay, but I just would like to see if we could um, answer uh, some of his um, some of his questions quickly. Yes, absolutely. So I know that Mr. Lancaster's testimony and the video testimony that um, we also had from Ms. Pleasure from Parkland mm -hmm. Middle School. Um, shared their concern. Um, I did want to respond. We have been in very much communication with the Poolsville community, quite frankly, the entire time about um, the work that's happening there and how we're trying to mitigate some of the concerns that they've presented. So we will continue to do that as well with the Parkland community who we've heard from today. Um, I know that Seth Adams is here and he has been uh, collaborating with many around making sure we're checking with air quality and all the impact uh, of making sure that we are doing this and that materials are safe for students. But nonetheless, again, I hear the concern that some parents are having, even though we um, have been able to verify that these are safe materials and have shared that students may have some reaction to it, it does cause some discomfort. In both situations, I just see the opportunity for us to reach out to some of these parents more uh, intentionally and share the process and the timeline of, of you know what is happening at the school and, and maybe get into some of the deeper understanding around how we've had the, the materials qualified to be safe so that they understand that. Um, so again, I see that as an outreach opportunity. Um, yet that we can further and I've uh, shared with Mr. Hull that, that follow up um, with some of these families specifically. Thank you. Hmm? Ms. Wolf. I also would like to thank um, <clears throat> Mr. Lancaster and Ms. Pleasure for coming out. I have met with Mr. Lancaster mm -hmm. and others from the Poolsville community 
and we are cu currently in the process of um, thinking about putting together a work group with Dr. K to talk about what we might be able to do differently in the future. It may not have a lot of impact on what's going on right now in Poolsville, but we wanted to get thoughts from everybody in the community about how we could improve what we're doing when we have construction going on in their schools. Ms. Harris. Yeah, just um, I'm seeing a lot of the uh, Einstein folks still here. I'm just wondering maybe Mr. Adams could step out in the hall and they could chat a little bit about the factors that are going on in the decision about the additional portables and see if they could come up. The students always have really good ideas. So. Is there no other location? Yeah. Anyway. Thank you. Mr. Kim? Uh, yes, I, I also uh, looked to that, that follow-up about uh, the, the portables, um, so I'll, I'll defer to that. I, I wanted to ask a couple questions uh, about this conversation around opt-out, just uh, to provide some context and clarity. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that uh, state law uh, it creates one uh, one condition where opt out where families can opt out from instruction, and that's um, the Family Life and Human Sexuality Unit of the Health Curriculum. I'm going to call down um, Ms. Hazel to the table, and because uh, thank you for bringing that up, I think we want to we do should clarify those pieces uh, so that our community is aware. Yes, that is correct. Uh, our Human Growth and Sexuality course is the only one that MSDE uh, says that parents have the right to opt out, and schools do a presentation for parents so that they can see what it is the students will be learning. Anything to add? No? Okay. Um, um, losing my train of thought. And then, so, so the, the, the context today is, is really coming from MCPS uh, aligning itself to uh, that condition set by the state uh, with, with these uh, six pic, uh, classroom supplementary picture books uh, with featuring LGBTQ plus characters uh, that were added to uh, classrooms this fall, correct? That is correct. These, right. these texts are in our literacy curriculum and the teachers are teaching literacy standards using inclusive text. Great. Could you speak a little, little bit more about the, the context of those texts and in what ways they might be LGBTQ plus inclusive? Yes, yeah, so um, we have been working uh, for the last two or three years uh, since the purchase of the benchmark curriculum to have more inclusive text of all kinds. Um, we recognize that that was one area that we needed to work on. So we have been purchasing a variety of texts over the number of years and sending them to schools. Uh, and um, our goal is to have our students um, in all of their classes, but we're starting specifically at elementary with our literacy curriculum, um, learning about literacy standards so they can be learning about the main idea in a text or author's point of view or problem and solution. And as we are doing that, we want to have texts that allow students to see themselves. So it can be um, a variety of, of uh, texts that in include students um, of all uh, races, ethnicities, gender, all of that. And so we did provide schools with six texts this school year to use. Our goal is to continue to add more inclusive texts over the years um, so that schools have a variety to select from. Thank you. That, that's uh, certainly helpful clarity. Uh, I think we've heard this from the community, all parts of our community, but uh, fundamentally, diversity is a good thing. Inclusion is a good thing, and, and by providing these diverse and inclusive texts, by aligning ourselves and following state guidance on when opt-out is appropriate, we are doing a service to our students um, by, by um, creating uh, an inclusive education. And it, it is certainly disheartening uh, to hear today about um, the cases of students being bullied uh, for practicing um, their religious beliefs in schools, and, and, and we know of students facing discrimination uh, based on their sexuality or their gender identity, uh, but across the board, um, by staying true to, to the value of diversity and inclusion, uh, we are addressing these issues in our schools, uh, and, and I think that um, 
that that that, that is the greatest service that, that we can do for for all of our students and uh, and this work around creating inclusive texts at the elementary school levels the the work around the anti-racist audit uh, the the new pilot courses uh, coming to our schools next fall, uh, like the Ethnic Studies course, for example, among several others that, that are inclusive of so many communities in our school system, are, are really um, starting to change the face of what it looks like to deliver an inclusive education. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that and, and make sure we uh, continue to inform that importance um, and, and send a clear message to all of our students that regardless of their gender identity or sexuality, regardless of their religion, um, this is their MCPS. And they have a right to see themselves in what they learn every day. Thank you. Mrs. Mondrowski? Yeah, just, just sort of really clear with everyone. So the, these are this just about the books. These aren't lessons on sexuality, right? That is correct. They are not lessons on sexuality. We are not teaching sex or sexuality, and it is not a curriculum. These are textbooks that are supplement to our ELA, English Language Arts Curriculum, where we are teaching the English Language Arts Standards. Right. Thank you. Um, and I did want to comment on that. Um, when we think about the diversity that exists within our community that are often referred to as a strength, and um, the school system absolutely has a responsibility to rec respect and support that. Every day when our children go home, then they have the lessons that are taught in their home that is reflective of culture, religion, and all of those pieces. Um, and we would expect that to be the case, um, and that that would continue in our community as it always has. So I, I did want to want to share that, because I think that's an important part of what we have to acknowledge and, and recognize, um, that we want to, you know, we, we would expect that there are values that come out of every home, um, and those are the lessons that are taught in that home. And this is not an invasion of that. And um, I wanted to ask Dr. McKnight, just as a process question, um, when people come to testify, your team connects with them to better understand what they testified for. So um, I just wanted just to follow up some of the people that came and we didn't um, address them fully. Dr. McKnight's team does reach out to them to better understand their, their concerns. and. Um, address them. So. Yes, and just to clarify, we normally do that with those who desire and want us to do that, and for those who um, are looking for, for that connection. Um, sometimes we will also catch them on their way out, which is what we often try to do to make that connection and determine at that point if they would like continued follow-up from, from us or not. But um, I think all of the things that we heard today, as we always do in public comment, does render the opportunity for continued discussion and conversation. So we are absolutely willing partners in, in wanting and always desire to do that for the benefit of all children in the system. Thank you. Okay, that concludes um, that section of our agenda. We are going to now move on to item number six, which is a work session regarding the superintendent's recommended FY24 operating budget, and I have a few remarks um, that I'd like to start us off with. This morning, the County Council voted on their final operating and capital improvements program budget. We are grateful for the funding received in support of our students, schools, and staff. This has been a challenging budget process that involved difficult decisions for the county and our school system. We are here today to have a discussion on the very difficult decisions that we must now make as we determine how to allocate the funding that we have received. The board is elected to provide the oversight and stewardship of the public school system. In our role, we must be zealous advocates for the students, the staff, and the families of MCPS. We identify what our schools need through countless hours of meeting with parents and staff visiting schools, participating in board and committee meetings. We identify the need and we advocate. We have done the advocacy. Now we have the difficult task of determining how to allocate those funds, knowing that out of necessity, some things will go undone. We know that each of our institutional partners have made every effort to fund the school system at a level that would allow us to meet this moment in time for our students, for our families, for our staff and community. Even with all of these efforts, we face difficult choices, not just today, 
but because next year's fiscal cliff is already looming on the horizon as the federal funds, the ESSER dollars, dry up. It is telling of the times that we are in, with student poverty at over 40 percent, an extremely competitive labor market, inflationary pricing, and growing student enrollment that even with a holistic, excuse me, with a historic level of local funding, we are faced with asking, what will we have to do without? And still have the students be ready for college, career, and community. As the Board of Education, it is our role to determine how to allocate funding so that it is reflective of our values and priorities. Given that as our framework, we have communicated to the superintendent that we will honor our negotiated contracts and we will not raise class size. I repeat, we will honor our negotiated contracts and we will not raise class size. We are also very aware that MCPS is at an inflection point in regard to academic achievement, and we are not willing to jeopardize the academic progress that we are beginning to see. Therefore, the board prioritized and is committed to strengthening mathematics instruction and increasing our capacity to serve our multilingual learners. We know that we must recruit and retain highly qualified staff, and that is why we must build capacity in our human resources office to do that. Blueprint requirements and safety and security are also a must. This is the guidance we have given the superintendent as she adjusts the budget to reflect the reality of our funding. Our budget priorities have been and continue to be on improving literacy and mathematics and fully staffing our schools. We heard the County Council address their concerns about the structural deficit. We are concerned about the coming ESSER structural cliff as the funding dries up, and we have many critical services funded through those dollars. It was clear to the board that in order to fund the contracts, maintain class sizes, and address urgent needs in math and literacy, we would need to move critical budget items to the ESSER grant. In other words, in order to make this budget work, we must move critical services to students to federal funding that ends next year. That money disappears, but the needs of the school system will not. As difficult as this year has been, next, year budget, next year's budget will in all likelihood present even greater challenges. We are committed to working with our county partners through the coming year to deepen the conversation and understanding around the MCPS budget and our students' needs. It is imperative that we work together because there is much at stake. The board has worked together to provide the superintendent with our guidance for modifying the budget given our level of funding. Therefore, now I will pass it to Dr. McKnight. I know the community will want to hear what adjustments we are making to our budget. Thank you, uh, Ms. Silvestri. So again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know we have been anticipating this conversation since we left County Council just a few weeks ago and really wanted to get into the conversation quickly about how we reconcile where we are today. And so here we are, um, and I, am, I know that many of our community members who have stake in the school system, the success of children in our school system, as well as our employees, are very much in tune to this discussion today because, in fact, everyone is impacted by the budget one way or another. And today I hope that this presentation is able to provide that level of clarity, particularly in the path of how we uh, move forward. And then I know this morning the county council was meeting and when they were working to approve the budget for the county overall this morning. And so MCPS represents a part of many of the, uh, the institutions that the county council provides funding for in the county. Um, so, you know, as I said throughout the budget process, you know, we are people's business, no doubt about it. Um, you know, we definitely knew and understood that through the pandemic uh, when we had to depend on people to bring together educational infrastructure. And so with that, I am excited that on our next board meeting on June 6th, as Ms. Avestri noted, that we will be able to celebrate that we have been able to fully fund our negotiated contracts in which we and the association have, have worked together for months on trying to reconcile. And I do believe that that is the right thing to do for the hard work working employees that we see doing the work of our, um, on behalf of our students every single day. And I am so appreciative because I have, oh, and I believe I just see a county council member walking in. Good afternoon, uh, okay. council member Mink. Um, 
Um, I, I was just uh, sharing, yeah, we've spent much time together talking about the, the, the needs of our system, and, and I am excited that we're able to applaud our employees. Um, you know, as people think about this process and you think about employees, I know that we're in the bubble as a school system, as board members and staff, and we see up front all the time the work that people do in the best conditions, in the worst conditions, in the conditions of trying to figure out what needs to be created that doesn't exist. And we do that with many minds and many hearts. And so that's represented in every employee that contributes to the success of the, our students, bus drivers, teachers, principals, librarians, building service workers, and I'm going to stop because, as I said, every time I do that and I don't name someone, um, you know, I miss out. But there are so many people who commit their life, quite frankly, to education. And I say their life because they just don't come to work and work for six, seven hours a day and then go home. Many of them are taking work home and doing other things, and while we don't encourage that and we want to, you know, want to support them in doing it, it is, it, is, it is not easy. And it's not easy when we think about how they have to plan and provision for so many more and different needs that did not exist before COVID-19 that we now have to attend to. And so I just want to elevate that when I say our hardworking employees um, deserve what we have been able to provide for them, Absolutely, that, that goes undenied. Um, and so as we think about how we reconcile this budget, um, the board, I thank you for the guidance that you provided and much of the, the resolution that we came to because we also had to say, okay, in balancing all of this, we know we have to uh, address the needs of our employees with inflation and everything, but our students are centered in the work that we do and we have to think about what their needs are. Um, and so we entertain uh, the things that we had to consider when it came down to finding money in the couch. And we're talking almost $80 million of that, which, which doesn't exist. And we also know that there are ways in which you work with the school system's budget to get larger amounts. And so it does come into things like class size. But we also felt that, given the impact of the pandemic, that was not something that would benefit our students and our staff at this time. So we avoided that. and. Um, so with that, today we're going to talk about how we got there. And we did have to make some, uh, some changes, like um, making adjustments in our accelerators. Do we believe in every single accelerator that we presented? Absolutely. Especially, because many had questions about, well, the superintendent presented a budget in December, but then the board came back and added to that budget. I want to clarify why. In December, when I presented my budget, yes, we had a number of accelerators in there that we believed in to further the impact of our students and their needs. But we also got our first data report from the state that we had gotten in almost two years that really clarified for us where we were academically in the state around mathematics and literacy. And you all pushed and said, you know, we need more. We need more and we need that to be clear. And so we went back and we worked on that and we bought it back. And what was powerful in that process was we believed in everything we brought back. As a matter of fact, we said we all felt so good about what we had in this budget to help move where our students needed to be. Um, we were excited and looked forward to engaging in this process. So while we've had to make some changes in the accelerators, please note, and I think it's worth noting, that every accelerator that we put forward um, that we thought would benefit or knew that would benefit our students, we still believe in that. And so it was an arduous process to go through and figure out what do you take away. Um, but we did. And so today we're going to share how some of those accelerators resulted in us um, essentially cutting about half of them and then considering what was going to be most important given uh, the needs of our students. So we're going to do that. And then I'll just end with um, the really important reality that we have to start to think about right now. We have taken significant, a significant amount of money from our ESSER funding, one-time money, grant money that we knew and know will end next year to protect some of the interests that were not funded, mainly two interests that we always have to reconcile, students who are coming to the school system, right? I mean, they are going to show up, and we celebrate the fact that our students are returning and that our, our numbers are growing, but they're going to be here. And that means funding has to be in place for us to support their needs. So that enrollment increase is a true reality. The inflation is a true reality of everything costing more. And so we had to use 
uh, more of our ESSER funding, which we'll go into detail about, to cover some of those things that just still exist that we have to be able to provide the level of funding for that we need. But I say that because while that helps us at this moment, it is not going to help us next year when that money is no longer there. And we all receive the emails from our community and our families about the things that they find valuable that we've been able to fund through ESSER. Things like tutoring. We've been able to cover summer school costs for students knowing that they need extra time. Many of those things are covered by ESSER and we will no longer be able to offer those. Um, especially given the fact that some of that needs to be removed off of ESSER right now to replace some of the needs, particularly around math and literacy and the accelerators that we have uh, we've presented in this budget. So, you know, we're having to make reductions in that way. We've having we also made reductions to our base budget um, to to come to reconciliation. And so I, I just share that because I think our budget conversation. I see some members of our budget advisory um, committee here in the audience. Our work will re will begin the minute this budget is approved for next year, <laughs> given uh, some of the difficult work that we have to do to prepare for next year. So nonetheless, there are a number of things to celebrate. Um, again, um, with this budget, the, uh, the 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 support for our staff is really important. And I also end with you know while there are many needs, we recognize that accountability is true. We are accountable to our board. Board of Education, as you know, which we take seriously and we're accountable to our community, um, you know, who expects us to continue to have a robust educational infrastructure here in Montgomery County Public Schools. And so we are committed to that and um, look forward to continuing to start building the next operating budget in consideration of the 162,000 students that we're serving and the additional ones that will be joining us, which we will be uh, happy to receive. So with that, um, I will turn this presentation over to Mr. Hull and Mr. Riley, who will walk us through. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. McKnight, uh, members of the Board of Education. So we're going to dive into a little bit more detail about the budget, as the superintendent alluded to. But I do want to just take a moment to acknowledge um, that this was the largest budget increase that we have ever received as a school system. Um, and so that's very exciting. It has also allowed us to uh, provide the largest compensation package by far that we've ever provided for our employees. Uh, and that is really exciting, especially in this time when we know that public education and the folks working every single day in our schools to serve our students and our communities are working harder than ever as uh, they support our students through the uh, recovery from COVID-19. So. Uh, Two really big things to celebrate and a big thank you to all of the staff, uh, teachers and others that are out there. Uh, and I also want to just say thank you to this board uh, for all of your support and your input as we have worked through this budget process. Uh, the county council, um, our community partners, including the budget advisory committee, as the superintendent alluded to, our three partner associations, uh, and certainly uh, Mr. Riley and his budget team for all of the very hard work that they have put into this uh, process over the past eight months. So I will uh, pause there and turn it over to Mr. Riley. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, good evening, uh, Ms. Silvestri, President Silvestri and board members. Um, so this just gives you a little uh, history of where we're at right now. Um, so after multiple hearings and work sessions, uh, I would say more public input and stakeholder involvement than ever before from what I from what I recall. Um, on February 23rd, the board uh, adopted their $3.2 billion budget, which is an increase of $296 million over last year. And on May 18th, the County Council uh, took a straw vote, um, and the local contribution was reduced by uh, $74.3 million. This morning, the County Council approved uh, by category uh, the amount which was consistent with their straw vote last week. And next week, the Board will adopt the FY24 operating budget on June 6, 2023. Next slide. Uh, so we're looking here at revenue, but I just wanted to uh, give a little background. So uh, doc, as was noted, Doc McKnight and the board have built this budget based on the needs of the students. Um, and to balance that budget, those needs are dependent on the appropri appropriations of our funding sources, which you see here, our, our, lo our local, our state, our federal, and our fund balance. Uh, so as I mentioned before, our local contribution, uh, the largest request ever made, $230.7 $230 million. The county uh, has approved this morning $156.4 million above what was uh, Given, provided last year, uh, again, a record amount, uh, but a difference of $74.3 million between what was given and, and the needs 
uh, of the system. State revenue didn't change from when we met when the board tentatively adopted their budget um, in February, and that remained at $69.5 million increase over last year. Federal revenue, um, actually, we did get in April an increase uh, of $23.2 million, and that's largely due to increase in Title I and IDEA grants. Uh, but I just want to um, remind everybody that you see there's a $23.4 million increase over last year, but that is restricted funds. That couldn't be used in balancing the operating budget. Uh, the enterprise and other revenue, uh, you'll see a, a slight decrease there. Um, that is related to our um, special revenue instructional TV fund, uh, which because of the decrease in uh, revenues from the county from cable TV, uh, there was a decrease there of $0.1 million. And the last item, you'll see there's no change um, from last from the, when we met last on the uh, the fund balance, um, but you, we've heard that the fund balance will be, um, we, we won't have that uh, uh, to use next year. But for 24, and what that represents was $25 million that was saved so we could uh, uh, move through uh, this year's budget. Next year, that will go down to zero. So that minus 10 represents the 35 million that we had to balance 23, and the 25 million that we're using to balance 24. FY24. So, um, so I, I just went through a, a bunch of increases and, and changes in our revenue. I'm going to pass it back to Mr. Hull, who's going to um, start the discussion on the changes needed from our expenses. Great. Thank you, Mr. Riley. If we could go to the next slide, please. Okay. So, um, I'm just going to walk you really briefly through uh, kind of where we got here and why we have this uh, this gap that we're trying to close. So the board put forward a recommended uh, recommended budget of uh, two billion sixty nine million dollars and change uh, to the county. The county executive put forth uh, his budget recommendation, which lowered the board's request by seven point four million dollars. We then took uh, that recommendation to County Council, um, where in the Education and Culture Committee, uh, they recommended that we use the $25 million in fund balance uh, that we started this year with and that we will end this year with uh, to fund next year's budget. So as Mr. Riley noted, uh, that will not be available in FY25. Um, so that re uh, represented uh, the first reduction there. Then uh, before the full council, uh, the amount was reduced further by an additional $44.6 million. So the county budget that they approved this morning uh, is $1.995 billion for the school system. And that leaves the gap of $74 million. And this is the amount that we had discussed directly with county council when we were there uh, in front of them uh, several weeks ago, <laughs> noting that if we were funded at what they were calling the seven tranches uh, instead of the 10 that the board had recommended, there would be this $74 million uh, gap that would need to be closed. Next slide, please. So since then, since the board um, adopted its budget back on February 23rd, there have been a few additional changes. Um, as we finalized negotiations with our three association partners, uh, there was an additional cost of about $3 million there. Uh, additionally, uh, the warehouse, our new warehouse lease, uh, that we were originally told back in the fall that that would be uh, covered by the county executive. Uh, later, after the board had adopted the budget, without that included in the budget, we were informed that we, in fact, would be responsible for funding that through our operating budget. So that represents an increased cost of a, a million dollars there. And then finally, um, after, bless you. Um, after the uh, board uh, adopted its budget, we received notification from MSDE that we would be required in next year, FY24, to implement the uh, career advising services through the, uh, as required through the blueprint. And that uh, has a price tag of an additional $9.7 million. So as we reconcile that, it leaves a total gap of um, 88 Point one uh, million dollars, and I just want to note that the reason that we're making these changes now and not as we went is that uh, we just stuck with the board's adopted budget. We didn't want to confuse people. Obviously, there was enough confusion this spring as it was. Changing numbers midstream would have caused additional confusion, and so we just stuck uh, with what the board had put forward, knowing that we would need to come back and reconcile these internally. Now we're doing it publicly. We've got a gap of eighty-eight point one million dollars. We need to close. Uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, so how are we closing that budget? Um, as Mr. Riley alluded to, we are going to use the $25 million in fund balance as recommended by the county council. That's included in the 30 million there. Uh, in addition to the 25 million in fund balance, we have increased our estimate for lapse and turnover uh, by 5 million. So that's how we get to the 30 million there. Um, as has been mentioned earlier, we have moved a significant uh, portion of our expenses for FY24 from the operating budget to ESSER to be able to maintain those services. That represents uh, $29.3 million. We reduced the accelerators. Originally, we had $47 million worth of accelerators included in the request. Uh, we were forced to lower that by just over $20 million, which means that we did keep some of the accelerators, um, as uh, has been noted, and we'll uh, look at what was maintained here in a few minutes. Uh, and then finally, we went back and uh, made cuts. We made cuts to our budget, our current operating budget, so things that are in the budget for this year that will not be in the budget for next year. That represented $8.6 million. And I just want to note, as I've mentioned uh, before at this table, that through the budget process on the front end, we had already identified $12 million in reductions and reallocations. This is on top of that. So over $20 million that we were able to go back uh, and repurpose for needs for the next school year. And again, you'll see that number at the bottom, the $88.1 million. Next slide, please. All right, so um, people who have been following along throughout the process uh, surely recognize the graphic here of our students sitting on a stool. Our budget uh, requests really had three components to it, or we called it the three legs of our stool. Uh, one was for increasing enrollment in inflationary costs. And as the superintendent noted, uh, that's happening, regardless of whether or not it's funded. The students are coming. Costs for fuel, food, and everything else have increased, and so that is needs to be accounted for. Um, originally, $23.5 million for uh, employee uh, salaries and benefits, as I noted on a previous slide. Uh, once we reconciled everything, that total is uh, $206.6 million now. And then finally, the accelerators, originally $47 million, are now down to $26.8 million. Um, and so as the county council uh, noted uh, repeatedly as they approved the budget, um, they were funding the cost for employee compensation. Uh, we honored that. Um, they gave us enough money to cover that leg of the stool, and we uh, greatly appreciate that effort on the part of our elected officials. But that left uh, two of the three legs of the stool unfunded. And as I mentioned earlier, the enrollment uh, is, is coming, the students are coming, and the inflation is happening to us. So as people talk about class sizes, how that comes into the conversation is if we do not fund the additional teachers for these 2,000 new students that are going to come next year. If we have the same number of uh, uh, same number of teachers and more students, that means higher class sizes. So we knew from the beginning that we were going to have to fund that leg of the stool, and so that is why we have gone back and made the adjustments uh, that we're talking about here today. Additionally, we knew that there were certain accelerators, as the board president mentioned, that had to be funded either because they were required by law or they were a priority of the superintendent and this board. Those include uh, accelerators targeted to uh, meeting the requirements of the Maryland, uh, the blueprint for Maryland's future. Additional security personnel, again, as we grow in enrollment and size of our buildings, we need additional security to maintain the safety of our schools. Uh, we invested, we maintained the investment in uh, human resources positions focused around recruitment, and we have maintained the la math and literacy investments that are so crucial to our students and that this board made very clear was a top priority. Um, so those uh, are the decisions that were made, and that has left us with a gap, uh, as we talked about on a previous slide, uh, of about $29 million that needed to be funded through ESSER. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now we'll get into a little bit of what was reduced or eliminated from ESSER. Just for the uh, general public, too, uh, ESSER, that is the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Um, and when, when we applied for that 
um, a few years ago, uh, there were two stipulations. There were 14 criteria of expenses that could be used, and two stipulations. One was to make sure the expenses were for the safe return to schools, and the other was for mitigating learning disruption. Um, and another, uh, an, another stipulation was that mitigating learning disruption had to be at least 20 percent of those expenses. So I, I just wanted to kind of frame that before we um, talk about what was reduced or eliminated. So at the time, you know, everybody mentioned the ESSER cliff, meaning that you know, when these funds run out, um, if, if you're if you're counting on them for recurring or ongoing expenditures, you're going to have to have to find a place for them in your operating budget. So we intentionally looked at items that um, could be uh, non-recurring, and we were very deliberate about that. Um, some of them aren't. Some of them you'll see that aren't, and and. Uh, I'll go through them now. So the first item that we were that we're talking about of uh, reducing or eliminating uh, to get to that $29.3 million is the social emotional learning curriculum. And that accounts for a reduction of approximately $14 million coming out of ESSER. Um, uh, the, another item was uh, food service. That one uh, was related to the safe return of schools, and we had uh, funds in there because at the time, if you recall, food service was feeding a lot of people. So the food service, which is an enterprise fund, actually uh, suffered a, a big loss. But So we had funds in there, um, uh, ESSER funds in there, to uh, kind of make that um, enterprise fund whole. But since, since then, we have had a, the food service fund has improved. So we are reducing $4 million of the remaining $6 million that was set aside there. Uh, virtual academy resources, uh, um, we had this conversation about a year ago. This was something that virtual academy that uh, was uh, uh, you know, started during uh, COVID, or, or I mean, we had a virtual academy, but it was a lot of funds were invested in that, and that's something that we realized that we did want to put in the operating budget. So um, much of virtual academy is actually in our operating budget and is funded based on enrollment. Um, there were some additional resources that not that are not enrollment basis, uh, not enrollment based, and those are uh, some of the funds that we're talking about reducing here. Uh, that's a reduction. Uh, the next one is out of school time, and that one, unfortunately, um, there's going to be in about a million dollars there being eliminated. Um, virtual Academy is about a million dollars. Um, out of school time is about a million dollars and it's, it's, uh, it's almost going to be eliminated. Uh, professional development, um, that one is going to be uh, reduced by about uh, two million dollars. Um, and that's specifically related to the anti-racist audit professional development. Um, we have funds in there to continue us through that process, but um, there's um, some other fund, there's additional funds that we can use there. Um, tutoring is another uh, one, unfortunately, that's going to be a, an elimination, um, and that's about eight million dollars. And finally, uh, FY25 summer school. Uh, we, if, if you recall, the last couple of years we've gone through universal summer school and then we um, cut it down a little this year. Um, the, the, this upcoming summer we are going to be using the funds that we were planning on using for FY25 summer school. Um, so that the remaining funds will be gone from that as well too, from summer school. Um, so just to, you know, when we talk about reducing or eliminating ESSER to find room in our operating budget, it's two components, right? So. We have to take funds that are in ESSER, take them out, and then we have to put funds that are in our operating budget back into ESSER. So we're doing, uh, you know, which we always, which we've been doing over the last few years, we've been doing uh, amendments to our um, ESSER um, grant. Um, so some of the things that are going in there are $13 million of curriculum. Um, we are, we're putting uh, psychologist positions in there, parent community coordinators, um, and obviously those are not uh, non-recurring. Those are recurring. So I, I think as Ms. Uh, Silvestri mentioned, um, one of the things that we're going to really have to be concentrated on as we get to the end of next year is these are things that we are definitely going to want back in the operating budget. Um, so that's going to be what we're going to be working on at the end, at this time next year, you know, how we're going to do that. So um, so that that's the um, items that are reduced or eliminated from ESSER. And can, can I just add as well, uh, uh, with the virtual academy, those reductions are being made as uh, enro enrollment has gone down, so it's not going to impact uh, the services to the students. The academy will continue. And for uh, summer school, FY25, um, so that will be next summer. Uh, we're still going to have summer school. We're just going back to the model that we used before COVID, which was one in which uh, parents who could afford to pay uh, did pay. And so it will just be returning to a previous model. The summer school is not going away. Uh, next slide, please. 
so in regards to accelerators, so accelerators, uh, part of what we needed to, to close that gap uh, was $20.2 million. So uh, we've, we've kind of uh, split some of the, the main accelerators that we talked about, which are a total of $47 million, and we split them to the ones on the left are the ones that will be funded, uh, and these are uh, blueprint related. Uh, we did. We had a lot. Board had a lot of discussion on math and literacy. So the math positions and the ELD coaches, uh, they will remain, um, as well as security system positions, HR positions. Um, you know, as was mentioned before, the, what's not accelerated does not mean we do not need them. And that's why we're saying these are not cuts. These are just not funded at this time. That'll be part of the discussion as we go through the next fiscal year budget of, you know, what on that right side. Uh, warrants being into the operating budget. So we'll have that as part of our budget discussions uh, next year. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, so finally, um, so largely due to the elimination of the fund balance and the fact that now we've talked about it, we have recurring expenses in ESSER. Um, we, we have to start thinking about what's going to make our budget sustainable. Um, so some, some of the things that we've done pre-COVID that we got away from was charging uh, parents and students that have the ability to pay for summer school. So this is something, one of the things that we'll have to revisit and look at. Um, the next one there, too, we haven't charged for extracurricular activities or, or uh, student activity fees uh, in many years. Um, I'm not saying that you know, we're going to have to do this, but I think we have to put this on the table to see if we can make this budget sustainable. Um, outdoor education, we did actually go back to charging for that um, post-COVID, as well as uh, food service. But I, I know there's been a lot of talk about um, universal meals, and if we get the funding from the state, um, that, that, that's great. But it would be very, very difficult for us to do that on our own dime. So that, that's why that's up there, too. Um, I said impossible. Yeah, yeah. Um, so some of the other things, I, and I hate to be doom and gloom here, uh, but uh, we, we have talked about potentially going into a freeze or using spending restrictions as we go into the next year as well, too. Um, in, in essence, our fund balance, of, you know, it was 35, then 25, but when we go into no fund balance next year, it doesn't exactly correlate, but it kind of equates to kind of what we have in the bank. So, you know, what we might have in our savings account, right, to sustain us through periods of inflation or unexpected expenditures. Um, without that, we're it's kind of living paycheck by paycheck, which is why I, I mentioned the word freeze. If we get three or four months into the year and we find that inflation increased more than we projected, um, we're going to have to look at those type of measures. So. Uh, next slide, please. And this is our final slide for um, today. And it just is a look ahead to FY25. So uh, the superintendent uh, and the board president both alluded to this. Um, we are making the best decisions that we can for the students that we have today. Um, and I think that it was uh, a very wise decision to avoid uh, going back and renegotiating or raising class sizes. Uh, and so we have made those investments using our one-time ESSER funds. As has been noted repeatedly today, those funds expire next September and will not be available going forward. So as we begin a very early look at our FY25 budget, um, we know that we're going to have about $110 million in employee compensation costs. So uh, one of the exciting things that we were able to accomplish this year with the partnership of our associations was two-year uh, compensation agreements for our employees. And if you remember, uh, for next year, that amount is over $206 million, uh, knowing that that would not be feasible two years in a row. Uh, this is a much more um, traditional uh, st uh, size of compensation request. It's $110 million, so that is already locked in. Um, we also are anticipating an additional almost 2,000 students for FY25. And again, we need to hire teachers uh, to account for those students, um, EL teachers, special ed teachers, et cetera. And that comes with a cost of approximately $20 million. Um, we know that there will be inflationary costs. This year we had about $25 million in the budget for inflation because of just the times we're living in. We are being optimistic and pulling that back to $10 million for next year, which I believe is a, 
a, a solid estimate, but of course no one knows what's going to happen with the economy. Uh, we know that we're going to have another $17 million in requirements for the uh, Blueprint for Maryland's future, and so we've accounted for those in FY25. And then the final amount is the $40 million that will be funded on ESSER in FY24 uh, that we will have to move back to the operating budget for FY25. And so we talked earlier about the $30 million that we're moving over through this process. There's an additional $10 million at a minimum that we believe will need to be included uh, in being moved over to the operating budget next year. That includes uh, the psychologists and the social workers that are currently sitting on ESSER that we know are a priority. And so we've gone right ahead and included those in our early estimates here. So that gives us a uh, gap, uh, or not a gap, but a, a initial budget need before we start looking at uh, any of the accelerators that weren't funded this year and new ones that may be needed for next year of 107, $197 million. And so, as everyone has said today, uh, next year's budget process is going to be very challenging. We will not have the federal uh, funds available, and so uh, some difficult choices are going to be, need to be made at all levels uh, to make sure that we're able to fund next year's budget and provide the services that we know our students need. So I will stop there and turn it back over to Mr. Benson. Yes, um, Mr. Riley, you mentioned um the psychologists and the social workers that are going to ESSER for this year, and we want them back in the budget. What, anything else, kind of big, big ticket items that are in that $40 million? Uh, Curriculum is a big $13 million of curriculum is as well, too. Um, and part of that decision was because I had mentioned before that 20% um, had to be for mitigating learning disruption. So, yep. um, No, I mean, I, I think everyone has spoken um, tremendously about the impact that our social workers have had uh, in our schools and how much they're needed. Of course, psychologists and what's a school system without curriculum. So uh, all of those things are critical. We're just buying time, really, and that's the situation um, that we're in. Ms. Wolf. I want to thank you for your work on this. This has really been a difficult job. I know that. I have a question on slide number 10. Um, I guess it's more, it's less of a question and more of a statement. When you start talking about uh, fees for summer school and extracurricular activities, I want you to remember that we have to consider equity in those things because everybody is not positioned the same in this county. So when you start thinking about having students go back and pay fees, I want you to remember that. I also just wanted to say that we are committed to having a world-class school system. So in that sense, I think we're going to have to begin our budget discussions for next year sooner rather than later, because I can see it looming as being a very difficult year. And I also uh, wanted to thank you for maintaining the focus on math and literacy, because you know that the board had placed a high priority on that. Um, I think Ms. Silvestri said everything on behalf of the board that I wanted to say, other than considerations of equity need to be maintained in anything that you're thinking about doing, because it, it does look as though we've moved a number of things into ESSER that are going to have to be moved back into the operating budget next year, and I'm hopeful that we will be able to maintain the level of service that we're doing this year. Thank you. And if I could just respond quickly about the equity piece, I appreciate you bringing that up. It's very important and something that we're constantly focused on. So we're not going to have students um, that are not able to get a lunch or participate in team activities or any extracurricular activities because they can't afford to pay. So that, that uh, is something that we will not uh, have. Ms. Rivetta Oven. Um, I, too, want to thank you for, um, for your work, for your overtime work, for, for making magic kind of happen. Um, wish we had a crystal ball, because really that's what we've been asking, you know, we're asking to do that, to look into a magic ball, to, to kind of say, you know, we think inflation is going to be this, but, and, and living paycheck to paycheck, that's literally how a lot of our families are living today, paycheck to paycheck. So 
there has to be some balance when we have, you know, the children that when we talk about equity, equity and we talk about being welcoming and we talk about these services, we talk about mental health, we talk about needing social, you know, um, psychologists and social workers. But yet, I want the public to understand this is a paycheck to paycheck situation. So we literally just kind of kicked the can down the road. And as someone just said, we just bought some time. And honestly, the work needs to start next week into looking how we're going to be able to move some of those funds back into so we can be that public school system that we all thrive to be for all our kids. But, you know, rest assured that what happened this year has consequences and those consequences affect the most vulnerable members of our community, which are our children, which is supposed to be our treasure and our future. So I want to thank all the teachers, uh, the unions for coming to an agreement, all the folks who have made all the sacrifices over the last three years during the pandemic. But we are still seeing the need, and it hurts for me to see food service, outdoor education, extracurricular activities, summer school on that list, because we're talking about our most vulnerable populations. And I just want to say thank you to Mrs. Wolf for, for, for highlighting that. And honestly, that says a lot about our character as a community. And I'm hopeful that next year um, that we're going to be able to do better because this is about you know our kids and it's about the future of this county and the workforce of this county. So I just wanna say thank you, thank you for that and um, I think we need to start rolling up our sleeves and to our partners in the audience, thank you so much for, um, for your work and your support. But let's not forget who we are talking about um, in this budget and not lose you know, our eye on the ball, but God forbid that you know, our inflation doesn't go the way that it's going. And we just saw articles lately of people not even being uh, buying homes anymore because the inflation keeps going up. So thank you for, for your work. And um, thanks for the patience of everybody who has been involved in the budget. And this was my first rodeo, and I have to say it was a bumpy one. <laughs> so I, I'm hoping that next year it's a little bit smoother. Thank you. Can I just say thanks to Ms. Uh, Director uh, Ivan Alfonso Windsor for all her work too, because you know all these numbers, you know, she's kind of running through that with her team. So, that's Ms. Harris. Yeah, and I do just want to start by thanking. I mean, I think, you know, we have an extraordinarily talented budget and finance staff. They work very, very hard. And you know, as I've seen as we've been going through this process for the past several months, and and um, even over the past week, multiple, multiple iterations of how we can adjust to the things that we predicted we we're going to need to serve our students and meet the needs of the system next year, but that we know we're not going to be able to fund. So I really do appreciate sort of the nimbleness and the um, just really the integrity that the team brings to this work. Um, and But I do want to kind of echo um, what's been said here is that, look, we, um, the community, through competing advocacy before the council and our 11 council members um, decided that this was the amount of money they were willing to spend for the public school system next year. And so we need to be very, very direct and honest when, you know, about expectations. And so I, I would like to understand a little bit more about um, on, on slide eight, uh, items reduced or eliminated from Esther, the out-of-school time, a million. What do we, what do we, what's going there? Um, so you'll remember when we had the calendar discussion uh, back in December and last fall that we had added three days um, that were going to be uh, PD opportunities by tier. And so each teacher uh, would receive an additional uh, professional development day. It also is going to include uh, activities for all of our students to get them engaged in the community. and. Uh, new types of learning in this out of school time and so it was something that we were excited about we included in the calendar for next year we included in the budget for next year unfortunately given the circumstances we're not able to fund it and so there will be more discussion later in today's meeting as we bring back revisions to the calendar around this issue I, that's what i suspected but um 
Yeah, and that's actually we were going to pilot that for the state. That was I was really excited about that. Um, okay, but being honest with you know expectations with the community, this is the the school system funding that um, that you were willing to give us for the next year, and so and I do just want to I, I, I there are a couple of things that are not going to be funded that I really you know full transparency. Um, that we've been talking about and been hearing from community that they were excited about. And I know Ms. Wolf has spoken in a great deal about the expansion of college tracks to five new schools. That's not going to happen. Um, and we were um, looking, uh, we had a lot of conversation early in the budget cycle around the, the planned expansion of our two way immersion and uh, innovative calendar schools. And the board was very clear that we wanted to, we wanted to to slow walk that and make sure that that was done very, very well and with a great deal of community engagement. And the response to that was to um, to create the um, specialists who are going to do nothing but support those programs as they exist now and engage with community around their expansion, really look at best practices and help us do what the board asked to be done. And so that's not going to be happening here, which I assume means we're going to be slowing the process of expanding those two-way immersion schools and those innovative calendar schools. And again, those are you know innovative work that we know um, is a tremendous evidence base around it, but we're not going to be able to do it. So managing those expectations, and um, those are the kinds of things that we want to I particularly want to really keep front and center as we look at the next budget year, as we need to start very, very soon. And the one other thing, um, we had a lot of um, facilities positions that came out, um, and um, that's why we have so many contracts for those kind of facilities maintenance, because we can't, you know, we, we have people or people business and when when we have to shift around our people we always make sure they go in the classroom and that means our facilities gets kind of sometimes a short end um, and so and also looking at the ITSS we had I think six positions in and they're not happening but I did want to put on the radar some of the things I've heard from some ITSS one of the things that they were really um, looking forward to were having some ITSS who were really dedicated specifically and only to our expanding level of security camera systems throughout the schools. And that the need to have people who, th that was their area of specialization, monitoring, maintenance, um, upgrading that, you know, that system. And, you know, that need was heard. It was reflected in the original budget. That's not happening either. So those are, you know, we're going to do the best we can. But these are things that I really want us to keep on, you know, front burner, because I think those were things that were, well, everything was needed, but um, that, so, and, and then giving grace next year when some of these issues arise and we are simply have to say we, we couldn't, we couldn't afford it this year. So, but anyway, but I do again, thank everyone for, um, you know, the, the nimble ongoing detailed work here. And I think it goes to, um, our ability, I think, going forward to really share this uh, in, more, in a more ongoing, continuous basis with our partners at the County Council so that some of the questions they had this year um, with, let's admit, six brand new council members. So as Ms. rivera Oven said, this was her first time through it. It was a bumpy one. Um, six brand new, more, the majority of council members brand new. So as we, you know, work together more closely and maybe share this kind of stuff, um, as we are so nimble and capable of doing, that will help the conversations that we have earlier and more often next year. So anyway, but thank you very much. I really do appreciate this work. Mrs. Mondrowski. Yep, I'll be brief. Everything's pretty much been said. I appreciate the equity comment. That was one of my concerns as well. Um, and, you know, uh, not looking forward to the next year's <laughs> trying to figure out a 200 million above MOE. But um, of course, I, I just had a clarification question about you mentioned about the professional development days being removed. Can you speak a little more specifically to that? Is it all of it's the three professional development days, but each um, level of um, schooling was only getting one, so we're removing all three, but none of the others. Is that correct? Because I know there's, we're doing a calendar adjustment later, and we just want to clarify. 
So those those would be when we look at our teachers, those would be the three days. And like you said, uh, the, the way that it was set up was they were going to go by tier. And so even though it was across three days, one for elementary, one for middle and one for high, it represented one additional day of professional development for every teacher in the district. All three of those are going away. So that is one day for each teacher that we will not be able to fund. Uh, we also had included in the original calendar a professional uh, development day for our SEIU staff that we thought was very important. Uh, unfortunately, that has been eliminated as well through the budget reductions. So it's one, one day for our teachers and one day for our SEIU uh, staff that has been uh, removed. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I just have, I have one clarification um, question for the FY 2025 summer school. That's not, that's, uh, we have taken out or reduced. How much does it cost for us to run a limited target summer school? What's the amount that's needed? Or what are we what are we expecting this year, for example? Yeah. Which is which is targeted, right? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> you can get back to us yeah. so Follow that we have that idea. I, I think we were using about fifteen to twenty million dollars from ESSER. Um, this year. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I, I don't know. I don't know the former. Summer school. I want to say because we, we talked about this before, it's average around 20 million mm -hmm. um, is what we've been av averaging um, over the last couple of years because that's what we, we've been planning for and using the ESSER fund with that average. But of course, we've been serving more students in summer school for the past couple of years than we ever have. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm anticipating that we will need to continue to do that because we are still in a recovery space from COVID 19. Thank you. Ms. Wolf? I just had one final thought, and that is, as you begin the budget discussions, it's going to become more important than ever that we uh, do evaluation, program evaluation, to see whether or not we even want to continue funding some of the, the items that we're funding this year. So just a thought. Yeah, I mentioned sustainability, and to have a sustainable budget, that is part of the process, right? Yeah, that was going to be my yeah. final comment as well. and. And the communication plan that is needed, right? So not everybody's watching this meeting. Surprise, surprise. Um, but uh, the public still, we need to, you know, to curate this information for various audiences, our county council, our families, our educators, um, so that everyone understands where they are. Because the budget process, you know, we, we, we identify the needs, people come testify, they're reacting to what they see, and then now it's gone. And so they're going to walk into our schools and say, hey, what happened to this? What happened to that? And so um, really urge the system to put out a strong communication plan so people know where they, we are. And we're going to make the most out of every single penny because our children, our educators, our families are counting on it. So we still need to greatly increase our literacy and math, and we're going to do that. We still need to make the most of our mental health supports because our kids need it. And so um, while this is a, a gloomy day because we have so many cuts that we are making and so such a uh, difficult year coming up, um, you know, we, we're going to make the, met, the best of every penny and uh, our, our students are counting on it. So thank you. Do you mind if I just address the question around the summer school while well, we're all still at the table? So this year, uh, we're using $13 million of ESSER money for that. The traditional summer school uh, runs us about $4 million, so a significant difference. So if there are no other uh, comments, I thank you so much for this presentation. Again, we're going to approve this uh, budget at our next, our next uh, meeting on June 6th. But uh, this has been a great um, public dis uh, discussion about where we are and uh, looking forward to the next one. Thank you. Okay, this moves us to our next agenda item, item seven, uh, which is a discussion on financial literacy, uh, which has been a topic that has come to the board uh, multiple times. And so this is a continuation of that, uh, that work. And uh, the, but the board asked the staff to continue to work on these options so that our students have many opportunities to, to learn this very valuable um, topic that is useful to them for the rest of their lives. And so with that, I turn it to Dr. McKnight. Thank you, uh, President Silvestri. So today we're going to have a discussion about opportunities for our students to can be able to 
for our students to be able to continue to engage in uh, financial literacy experiences in MCPS. Um, we agree and we've shared every time we brought this presentation forward that we as a system do believe that financial literacy is important and it's certainly important um, for our students so that they can become those citizens who have this information to better prepare them for their futures um, after they leave our school system and go off into college, work, and make all of those decisions that will impact them for years after. Um, and so with that said, we've constantly along the way in the years have tried to find ways to incorporate that financial literacy, acknowledging that it is important. As many of you know, we take our seventh graders to Financial Park, um, and so that's an opportunity for them to engage and go through a real life simulation experience that um, you know does get them in the middle school um, engaged in how important the financial decisions that they make are important. And then we also have the financial elective courses available to our students in high school as well. So um, I highlight those because those have been opportunities that we've planned for. But then even thinking about the future, we introduced our pathway to college career and community readiness. And in the pathways, um, you saw that we outlined the competencies for our students. And so we look for there to continue to be ways um, to provide financial literacy experience in the pathway as well um, as we've mapped that out. So just, to, just for the sake of understanding where we're going, in the fall of 2021, the board approved a resolution requesting that MCPS actually go back and explore our, our possibilities requiring a 0.5 credit for financial literacy um, with it being considered for graduation as a graduation requirement. And so we have been engaging with so many um, in our community to be a part of that conversation. We've done some benchmarking. It was requested that we do benchmarking against what other what else is happening in other school systems. We've done that. Uh, we've done a deep analysis on how this requirement could impact different groups of students in Montgomery County. And that's what we have to realize. The, there are so many tracks to graduation for, many, for so many different students that come into our school system. And we have to look at this from a perspective of who does it serve and who does it neglect in any way so that we are keeping that graduation focus on the horizon for all students in Montgomery County. So the recommendation reflected a need to balance increasing access while also managing the potential barriers that could exist. So today we're here to share an update with you um, on, uh, on the student participation and performance in the options uh, recommended for financial literacy and a graduation requirement. So with that, I welcome the team, and I believe I'm turning it over to Ms. Teresek, uh, the Director of Curriculum Instructional Programs, to kick us off today. I just wanted to add, for those that were not uh, at the meeting at the beginning, we did modify the agenda to move the um, new business item, which is a resolution around financial literacy and service learning, immediately after this discussion. Mm -hmm. So just as a reminder for our audience uh, that we will be talking about that some more after the presentation. Excellent. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. McKnight and members of the board for that introduction. Um, I am Maria Tarsic. I'm Director of Curriculum Implementation and Support. Now, I don't know who manages the scheduling of topics, but I think it is wonderful that financial literacy discussion is following the budget discussion. So however that got arranged, kudos, that was awesome. So I've been here at the table several other times over the last year and a half or so to discuss financial literacy. So for today's discussion, we're gonna kind of go through a couple of different components to share some information with you. Next slide, please. I want to build a little bit on the uh, review that Dr. McKnight already provided about our past actions, and then I'll go ahead and share that participation and performance data that we promised. Then I'll come forward with a recommendation of where we think we ought to go and what our next steps ought to be, and then we'll open it for, di for discussion, which I look forward to. Next slide, please. So our discussions over the last two years about financial literacy have connected to several priorities of Dr. McKnight's in the board. The academic ex um, excellence pillar one um, has the component of increasing the percentage of students graduating high school. So this reminds us to, re to be mindful of how we make decisions and recommendations that may impact a student's pathway to graduation. And it's because of this mindfulness that we have taken the approach of let's explore, let's try some other options, instead of just jumping into making a graduation requirement. In addition, as Dr. McKnight shared, the recently shared pathway um, for college career and community readiness has as one of the high school experiences some experiences with financial literacy. 
So and it's because of that that we are, that this conversation we're having today is so important and necessary right now as we continue to expand options for students. Next slide. And again, here are the equity impact questions. The two questions that I want you to keep most in mind today are, whom does this practice serve or neglect? And what adverse impacts or unintended consequences could result from this decision? And we ask these questions because the decisions we make about graduation requirements we know are gonna impact students differently across racial groups and service groups. And that's why we've taken so much time to be thoughtful about this discussion. Next slide. So Dr. Manite already shared a recap of our past actions going back to October of 21 when the consideration of a new graduation requirement was first proposed. And if passed, it would begin for our incoming ninth graders next school year. At the end of last year, we committed to building out several opportunities for students to learn about financial literacy. And now it's been just one school year since we began this work, and that work is still going on as we develop options. So here we are back to share our progress in implementing the four options that we shared last year. Uh, next slide, please. So before I review our four options, I do want to do one more walk down memory lane. Last year, if you recall, we also were mandated by the state to increase our health requirement by a half a credit course. And at that time, there was a lot of discussion here at the board about how to do that. In the end, we ended up reducing the total number of elective credits by 0.5 as we added that 0.5 health credit. And I bring this up just as a reminder of that conversation, that if we move forward with a 0.5 credit requirement, we'll need to have that conversation again. What is gonna be the impact on the overall credits for students? Do we add on and increase, or do we reduce electives again? So just keep that in your mind that we would have to continue with that conversation. Okay, next slide. So at the end of last year, the board approved our proposal to build and expand four different options for students to learn about financial literacy. We offered, um, or we suggested there would be credit bearing options as well as non-credit bearing options. The credit bearing options you can see listed on the left side of the screen. The three options were for the personal finance elective course taken in person. We also have a personal finance elective which is taken online through Edmentum. And we also have financial mathematics which is or will be next year, the rebranded, revised uh, quantitative literacy math course. In all three of these, students will earn service learning hours because there will be service learning projects embedded within the course. The non-credit bearing option, the fourth option is an online asynchronous, asynchronous module. That means students complete it without staff support. They complete it on their own their own time without teacher support. It's made up currently of about 14 units that would take approximately 16 to 17 hours to complete the way it's designed currently. There are no SSL hours connected to this course because SSL hours are expected to be earned either through a course or with the supervision of staff or an approved um, organization. And the reason for that is to ensure that the student service learning projects complete, meet all of the requirements of what an effective project is for um, preparation, meaning the learning, then the project, and then reflection that goes with it. So this fourth option has not yet been shared with students, so we don't have any data yet to share with you in terms of its effectiveness, its ease of access, or its participation. Next slide, please. So as part of our plan to expand access for students, we also wanted to provide some incentive and recognition for students. And so we will be providing all students who completed one of the credit bearing options with a cord to wear graduation. We have 4,630, actually a little bit more, we found a few more students we had missed, um, graduating seniors who will be receiving cords this year. As a matter of fact, they were delivered this week to our schools ahead of uh, graduation ceremonies. Next slide, please. So last June's board resolution asked us to come back with two uh, pieces of data, one around participation and one around performance. And the board member that you received does have more detailed information than what I'm gonna share here, but you'll see the highlights. On this screen, what you're seeing is the enrollment data for quantitative literacy and personal finance courses over the last few years. 
It also includes in the columns labeled 2024 our projected enrollment, which isn't quite complete, so we expect those numbers to go up a bit by the time school starts in the fall. Quantitative literacy is a course that's been around for many, many years, so it's no surprise that its enrollment numbers have been pretty stable over the last several years. But what I think is really encouraging is the increase in the number of students that are signing up for a personal finance elective. And that's really largely a result of the efforts of our social studies department to increase awareness of the course and resources for offering the course in our high schools. You can see that just a couple years ago, we were in only six schools, then in 13, and we're expecting to be in 18 schools for the next school year. Next slide, please. The next two charts that you're gonna see are showing performance data for the personal finance course last semester specifically pass-fail rates. Overall, the personal finance course has a pass rate of 97%. That's pretty high. This chart you're seeing breaks down for our service groups. For, so for emergent multilingual learners, there were 45 students in the first semester that had a pass rate of 98%. Farm students, 95%. Special education, 94%. Next slide, please. This slide now is showing the performance rate of our different demographic groups and their pass rates that range from 96% all the way to 100%. Now we chose to focus on the data for the personal finance course as this is the course that had the most recent updates to it. And if this was to become a graduation requirement, this is the course that most students would likely take. However, for comparison, I'll share a little bit of data about the quantitative literacy course last semester. Um, that pass rate was still relatively strong with about 90% of students passing the quantitative literacy A course. EML students passed at about 80% rate, 88% of Hispanic Latino students and 92% of African American or black students passed quantitative literacy in the first semester for comparison. So while this performance, particularly for personal finance, is worth celebrating, I do want to be careful about assuming that if we make it a graduation requirement, we would have the exact same high level of, of success. Keep in mind that the students in this course chose to take it because they were interested in the content and they felt confident they could be successful in it. Now we do think that personal finance as a course is a very engaging course and the students would continue to have a high success rate because it is engaging and particularly for our upperclassmen, it's highly relevant and they're um, interested in learning about it and really putting it to use. Uh, next slide. Because of our concerns about inequitable inequitable impacts on students. We did look to some other counties to see what their experience has been. These two counties, Carroll County and PG, Prince George's County, um, have had a financial literacy requirement for a couple of years. Prince George's fairly recently, Carroll County much, much further. Carroll County, although it's much smaller and less diverse than us, has had that high success rate. You can see they, they say a, a, a high 90% range, but they do limit the course just to their upperclassmen, the juniors and seniors. Now Prince George's, which obviously is much more similar to us in Montgomery County in its size and demographics, has had a little bit different of an experience so far, but it has only been a couple of years that they've been implementing it. They have shared that two of their challenges that they've seen emerging are students that are failing the course and will have to retake it at some point before they graduate. A lot of the students, the majority of the students that are failing it are ninth graders that are taking it, trying to get it out of the way, most likely as they get into high school. They also have shared that they have some concerns about their EML students that are level ones, that they don't quite yet have the language necessary to access the course and they're having some struggles with the course as well. Next slide. Before sharing the key considerations, I wanna re-echo what Dr. McKnight said and state clearly that it is the stance of the curriculum department that financial literacy is an important skill for high school students to learn. And we 100% support providing all students an opportunity to learn about financial literacy. However, we do believe that there are unintended consequences when it becomes a requirement. In addition to emails and pass-fail rates, there are other impacts to consider if financial literacy course is tied to graduation. None of these are insurmountable should MCPS decide to institute a requirement. But 
I want to be upfront with you about some of the challenges that we'll have to work through as part of the process. Now, these may sound familiar for those of you that were at the table a year ago. Um, we shared them last year, but they do bear re-elevating. First, scheduling challenges are created when there's a requirement for a 0.5 one semester course because it forces students to pair it with another 0.5 semester course. There's not quite as many of those as full year courses and just makes scheduling just a little bit more challenging. And this connects to the concerns, the next concern around student options. Students will have fewer openings in their day for electives if their choice of their choice because of the block that would be taken for financial literacy and then the other 0.5 semester course that they would have to choose to fit in that they might not otherwise have chosen. This is particularly impactful of students who have additional courses that they must take because of career pathways that they're on, because of AP, IB courses that they're taking, English language development courses, or even reading intervention courses that also take up time in their schedule. Shifts in staffing assignments would also have to occur. Teachers teaching electives may have to shift to teaching financial literacy in order to uh, fill all those courses. Class sizes could potentially go up in some cases as well as teachers have to shift to teaching the financial literacy course. And then finally, graduation. For students already challenged to meet their graduation requirements for any number of reasons, this additional requirement will be an added challenge for them. Next slide. So now our recommendation. We are proposing that we continue on the path that we started this past year with expanding access and opportunities rather than mandating a requirement. Not all four of the options have been fully implemented yet. The revised and newly branded financial mathematics course will be available this fall, as well as, well as the online modules that are being developed. And as I've said before, they've not yet been tested out with students, so we don't know how successful they're gonna be yet. We also believe there's a lot of room to grow still with the personal finance elective. Electives grow through grassroots efforts year over year at the school level, and this one is just getting started. We also want to make sure that all of our courses are more accessible for EML students, and until that happens, they won't sign up for a course that they don't think is set up for their success. Next slide. So here's what we currently have planned to support our efforts. Ongoing this spring right now, we're developing that financial mathematics, making those revisions. We're building the EML scaffolds for the personal finance course. This summer, we have professional learning planned for teachers of these courses. And then this fall, as I said, we'll be implementing those online financial literacy modules. We'll be able to get feedback from students on how successful they are. And we also will have a communication effort to share all of the four options that are available for students and families and encourage them to sign up. And so at this time, I'll turn things back to President Silvestri and the board for discussion. Um, just a quick question to get us started. Um, can you describe what the online Edmentium course is like? Is that uh, asynchronous? That has um, some teacher component with it as well. It's the, the online, Edmentium is the um, platform that delivers all of our online courses for students. What does it mean that, that it has a, some teacher component? What does that mean? Your light's on. You're on. A, am I on? Oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to see if it's Tracy, Oliver, Gary, are you able to answer that one a little better than I can? I'm going to say it's the content. Tracy is our social studies supervisor and has done a lot of the work around expanding the course and has been speaking with our online team uh, more frequently than I have. Mm-hmm. Hi, from my understanding, it's like once a week where they're check-ins with students, something like that. It's how our other online courses go. It's not every day, if do that's you, what you're asking. Do you know what the uh, service learning experience is like? Yes. So the service learning experience for both the personal fr um, finance elective that's in person and the Edmentum course will be on understanding um, um, financial inequities, financial um, discrimination in, in understanding finances or how people have been treated in um, the financial sphere, as well as building wealth, how to build wealth. So that's a, like a project that That's a project, yeah, it's a project. And how many Racial hours? discrimination and building wealth, that's the name of the project. 
How many hours of service learning do they get for those classes? For the personal finance elective, it's five, but for the um, mathematics course, financial mathematics course, they will get 10 hours because there will be a project each semester because it's a year-long course. I'm not sure what those projects are yet. They're working on it. At the uh, online one get SSL too? All, all of the credit. All of the credit bearing. SSL. All credit bearing will. Mm -hmm. um, I had asked for this before. I don't. Maybe it's on the way with a, as a follow up. But uh, demo, <coughs> demographics of who is accessing the current options. Uh, Four thousand some students are getting the cord. That's less than fifty percent. And I know we're just starting this, right? And you hope that you know it will slowly increase. But um, if we could, if I could get the demographics for who, if I'm assuming you have them. Uh, who is accessing um, the courses now? Um, again, just so we can get a handle on the equity mm -hmm. issue. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Yep. Mrs. Majewski. Thanks. Um, so thank you for continuing to work on this. I believe it should be a graduation requirement, personally. Um, so I like seeing us doing everything we can to get as close to there as possible. Um, I did have two questions, sort of. Um, why would anybody do the non-credit bearing option if they don't even get SSL hours for it? And is there not a way that we could make them have to do a project after they take the 17 hour module so that they get 20 hours of SSL or something? So the modules were proposed as, as a way for students who didn't who were interested in the content, mm -hmm. but didn't have room in their schedule. Yes. And so that's why we, we have that. Right. So in terms of adding a SSL project, we'd have to really think through how to do that in a way that would be authentic, would be um, truly valid, and have a process for teachers to be able to review that, certify that the project was done, and the hours awarded. Well, I'd really appreciate if we would look at that, because mm -hmm. I don't know, even if, I mean, that's a lot of time to spend on something and receive no anything for it. Um, so it just would surprise me if a lot of people would participate in that option. We also did discuss having those students would receive a recognition for graduation as well. Okay, I love that idea too, but I just think that the SSL hour would be um, a, a nice something for them to, you know, have to add towards what they're working for. Um, the other thing is not especially relevant, but oh, I'm sure, um, Ms. Hazel, you remember, um, you know, years ago we kind of started saying that we didn't feel like a D was a very good indicator of successful completion of a course, even though it is technically passing. I don't know if you remember these conversations from forever ago. Um, We've kind of, so for a while we had started saying, you know, C or above, uh, or C minus or above. Um, we don't do that anymore, I'm not sure why, but is there any way of knowing, do we have any kind of breakdown as to when we say, you know, 92% rate, how much of that is like just barely passing or? Yeah, in the, in the board memo, there is, for that personal finance course, mm -hmm. the first semester of the data that we did show, the breakdown for A, B, C, D for the sub oh, I do remember is in there. That, but there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. This is Roberta Oven. Um, thank you so much for, for the presentation. It's, it's, it's great. Um, I'm, I'm just delighted that students are taking this. It's, it's so needed, and I see it... Um, with um, my son's uh, generation, they're in college right now, and this is incredibly useful. Uh, with the ESOL EML students, I know that uh, Carroll County and Prince George's County is looking at, and I don't know if Prince George's County started doing um, the program in Spanish because that's the largest group of ESOL students that they have. Have we looked into doing that as well? Because it is really hard for either a ninth grader or tenth grader who comes into our system with language um, limitations. Um, and if anybody needs some of this information in this curriculum, I would I would argue that is this population. Um, anything that we're doing to look into that, I can share that the um, the online modules 
Um, a majority of them are also available in Spanish, and so we would be able to set up a course that would just be in Spanish um, using the modules. Now, for the other courses, we're building in the EML supports um, at this point. Um, as more students enroll, and if there were, this were to become a graduation requirement when we would have thousands and thousands of students taking the course, then we can certainly look at having sections that would be just, you know, for, uh, for Spanish speakers. Um, that certainly is, a, is an option for us to look at. And just very quickly, keep in mind that sometimes online can be challenging for these groups of students because not everybody is, um, has the benefit of having online at home. So that's why if, if I'm seeming a little pushy, it's because I know that there's that, um, that disparity that is quite alive still in our community. Thank you. Well, um, again, thank you for the presentation. I think uh, we are all in agreement that this is critical information for our students to have as they are leave us and are community ready, college ready. I mean, we make a lot of mistakes when we, uh, we don't have this knowledge as we enter the world, the workplace, et cetera. Um, why they offer credit cards to college students on campus is beyond me because <laughs> we're just grabbing them all. Um, and, and I think for, for my, my interest personally is that we uh, build systems and options so that all our students, I mean all our students, are able to access and take advantage of this information. And so um, I think that uh, we're looking for creative solutions so that that happens. Right now, uh, as a former student member used to say, um, if you don't require it, they're not going to do it. And so, um, you know, looking for your creative um, thinking around how we get everyone to do it. However, that is uh, the way to make it happen. And so whether uh, my, the, the business item, of course, talks about service learning, but um, yeah, I just wanted to make that, send that message that it's about getting everyone to do it because it's, it's uh, critically important, as, as we all know. So um, with that, I think we can, um, conclude this conversation and, and move on to our next agenda item, which, as I said, it's modified. It's the uh, item 12.3, which is the new business item. And I now have so many papers in front of me that, um, let's see, let me, give me a sec to find it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so this, um, this new business item, um, I'm just going to read uh, some of this parts. And uh, what we're doing today is just introducing. I'll need a motion in a second. It'll sit on the table uh, until the next uh, board meeting, at which point we can uh, decide on how to move forward. Uh, so whereas Montgomery County Board of Education is, is committed to ensuring that MCPS students are college, career, and community ready, Whereas the board believes that an important indicator of college, career, and community readiness is financial literacy education that exposes students to the basics of building credit, borrowing money, budgeting, avoiding pitfalls, and other important topics. And whereas the uh, students have told us throughout the years that they wanted courses that were more relevant to their everyday lives. Whereas the board has requested the superintendent to explore the implications of making financial literacy education a 0.5 credit re graduation requirement. And whereas it is important that all students have multiple options for learning about financial literacy before they finish high school. And whereas the board believes that ensuring that students receive meaningful financial literacy education positions them to make financially sound decisions that they can carry with them for the rest of their lives. Now, therefore, it be it resolved that the Board of Education direct the superintendent to develop a plan to embed a five-hour financial literacy component within the student service learning requirement, beginning with students entering grade nine for the 24-25 school year, class of 2028. Students will be provided with multiple options to satisfy the requirement, including course offerings and online modules, under development, including an online module in Spanish. The superintendent must advertise the full menu of options for fulfilling the requirement to students and families. Can I get a motion? I move approval of 
letting it be on the table. <laughs> Second. Any uh, questions or discussion, Mr. Kim? Uh, I'm kind of wondering why, uh, or I just want to kind of hear the, uh, the idea behind capturing that requirement within the, the student service learning requirement. My initial reaction is, um, you know, in, in the options currently offered, there are uh, pieces around uh, service learning, but as we heard, those service learning projects are embedded within the course. It's not um, the concept that financial literacy within itself uh, entirely is service learning. Um, so I, to me, that my initial reaction is that uh, we're conflating financial literacy uh, and student service learning. Uh, so I just kind of want to hear the idea behind that. So I, I think it goes back to the idea of requiring and 60, credit, 60 hours of service learning is already a requirement for graduation. So rather than going the route of requiring a, a 0.5 credit course as a requirement for graduation, why don't we piggyback on an ex existing requirement and say, OK, you have to do 60 hours, five of those hours, or whatever the administration suggests, would be, um, would be financial literacy, be it with a credit course or an online module. I think what we're asking the staff is to develop a non-credit uh, online module that also integrates a service learning project so that they can fulfill that as well, in addition to the Spanish option. I see. Thank That's you. That's the um, explanation. Yeah. Again, my initial reaction is I, I think there certainly is overlap between financial literacy and service learning, but that overlap is not complete and entire. Therefore, either uh, financial literacy becomes something it, it's not entirely, or service learning becomes something it's not entirely. Um, what I might be, and uh, I'm certainly looking to accept this resolution um, to, to, to discuss ahead of the vote at our next meeting, but what I might be interested in looking at is, um, you know, my understanding is that a number of uh, graduation requirements right now aren't SSL or um, the um, course uh, requirements. There, there's testing requirements uh, to graduate. There's, um, and, and even outside of graduation requirements, all students undergo, like, the first example that pops into my head, the, the signs of suicide uh, module. Uh, and that's something that, while not a, a course graduation requirement, I think um, uh, our system does a really good job of ensuring that students are, are, are there for that. And if they're not there for that, following up and creating new opportunities. Uh, all to say that uh, I, I think even outside of our, our just the courses and just the SSL, there's other opportunities to explore it uh, as perhaps a graduation requirement. Uh, I, I certainly agree with the ideas that it should be satisfied. Um, either through a course offering or, or those online modules, maybe even exploring the idea of uh, having students being able to test out of it. Uh, if the rationale is that all students want, we want all students to graduate with that knowledge, do they really need to undergo further learning if they can demonstrate that knowledge? Um, and I think that exploring uh, um, maybe a, 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 I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, a, a completely kind of new uh, way of uh, creating a graduation requirement is also in alignment with uh, some of the ongoing work around uh, the, the college career readiness pathways. As we have financial literacy among all these other competencies, we can really start to explore how uh, we ensure that the profile of every MCPS graduate uh, contains all those other competencies, this being one of them. So uh, that's a conversation I look to have um, leading up to, to the vote at the next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Kim. I, I look forward to talking about it further with you. I know Dr. Murphy has his light on, but I just wanted to ask or mention quickly about the testing out thing. That's something that we also, I think, they've looked at incorporating as well, I think, right? Because we talked about that before, so I, I like that idea. Dr. Murphy. Thank you. Um, I think Mr. Kim's comments are, are very astute, and I would just caution the board that uh, to some extent this is conflating the issue. Um, I believe either it's required or it's not required. And I would also say that based on the data that we've looked at at this point, I would allow it to develop one more year and bring it back. I know the board's going to um, you know, consider it or look at it uh, before the next meeting, but I, I feel it incumbent that we bring that forward, coupled with the fact that staff did allude to it, but maybe not expand on it that the monitoring of this is going to 
be an additional responsibility that I think we just have to look at under the, the current construct. So I just wanted to bring those points forward uh, in your deliberations and your thinking, uh, but encourage uh, you to think about how maybe to let it mature one more year before uh, making a, a final decision. So um, just trying to understand <coughs> what you're saying, but you have built SSL into the current courses, so um, yeah, let me let me think about what you're saying. So you're saying keep them separate; they're not one and the same. But your courses have integrated SSL, and the the fact is that students in this county do SSL in a wide variety and all kinds of. Uh, circumstances, some very meaningful and some not so meaningful, I, not, not to dismiss that, but um, I guess uh, the experience of providing SSL is extremely varied. I mean, you can, you can do it in any number of ways. Uh, why not through a project that involves financial literacy that the staff has yet to develop and in some cases has developed in the course options? I'm yeah. going to go to Ms. Yang. Um, I want to ask, this is, uh, you know, whenever we talk about um, creating a new course and making new requirements, we do need to ask a lot of questions of who does it impact, how is it impacting, and what's the effect on staffing and, and operation impact. So um, if I may ask Dr. Uh, Murphy, um, if we wait, what are you going to bring forward that's what we have not heard today. Different, what will be the things yeah, that you will explore in this year's time? I think Dr. Pugh has some data that she's ready to share. And I think one of the things we would look at is um, I, I'm very conscious about how students are being able to fit these things into their schedule. Mm -hmm. I'm also very conscious of uh, the different uh, course loads that students have, especially for students uh, who are multi-language uh, language learners. And I think that has probably got my acute attention because of one of the things this board and our district believe strongly in is making sure that we provide those equitable opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think allowing this to mature, allowing us to build some of these things out a little bit stronger uh, will provide that greater equity as we move forward. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Pugh, I don't... Yeah, I just wanted to answer the question about what's what's needed if we were making a module um, and equating it with SSL. And we do have many things that are in SSL, or that courses that have SSL built into it, because it is an extremely challenging thing for many students and families to complete. And so it sometimes is a barrier to graduation by itself, just the fact that it is a, a requirement that they have to do. And so that is why it's purposefully built into some courses so that as the grad validation teams meet with students and they identify that that student hasn't met that graduation requirement, they can recommend projects and things that are already built in that have teacher support. Students can offer, offer and I think this is what Mr. Kim's point was, it is about, so SSL, in my understanding, is about the student actually identifying a service that the, that the community needs, proposing that service, then doing that service, and then reflecting on it, having some sort of authority at that place where they did the service, verify that they were there. It's not a school-generated um, piece. So the school itself then is just entering in that another adult verified that process. Currently, the reason that there isn't anything built into that online module the same way it's not built in to the suicide module or any of those other ones is because we don't have teachers leading those courses. It, there's just not uh, staff to reallocate to say, now you're going to, uh, or the financial liter mathematics teacher or the personal finance teacher is going to be required to also grade and score and validate all of the other half of the student body who currently isn't in the course if they choose to do it in this alternative way. So that's a considerable thing to have to lift up. Um, it does require some change, but I wanted to respond to that question about wh why couldn't we just do it that quickly and that easily. Um, the other piece I would say is they're still building the SSL 
uh, components, projects, because it's not an easy match um, to say, what would a student find as a community financial need or issue? So they have the one that was built initially for the five credits, and it's two semesters. But then as they're revising the course, it's not an easy, easy lift or match. Um, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring it into the discussion. So the way Mr. Kim spoke about the CCR requirements, those are new for all of us. And it's going to be the first time students in a long time are required to pass math and English. And so you know what our data are right now at 10th grade for all of our students. Moving forward, as they go into the pathways, it's either AP IB, dual enrollment, um, career technical education, or support. Right now, if we aren't improving math and literacy, which you've made such a good commitment to, uh, we have a large number of students that will go into support, which will further take up elective and other required time in their schedule to be able to move forward. The second thing that I would remind the board is that our students soon, uh, and Dr. Addison can give me the exact year, are going to be required um, to take end of course exams in science and social studies. And those exams are going to count for 20% of the grade. And so as we're layering on requirements that are being brought down to us, I just want us to be aware of the impact that it's going to have on students and on their ability to make choices of things that they can participate in. Our, our international baccalaureate students right now have to choose. I can only do band one semester. I mean, that's a terrible choice to have to put children and families in, but I just, it's, it's, it's still a requirement even if it's done a different way and it will still have impact on some children, so. Mr. Kim. I'm glad I won't be here for those end of year exams. Uh, <laughs> uh, one thing I, I, I just thought of as you're speaking, don't we offer to do like a culture of respect module that students can be awarded SSL hours for? Good afternoon. Um, so service learning is one of my favorite topics to speak about, so thank you for bringing me to the table. Um, and I would say that um, you know our supervisors and our um, colleagues have um, spoken well about the program um, in and of itself. Um, to directly answer your question, Mr. Kim, we did build. Um, actually, my team unit is responsible for um, that collaboration and pulling those um, cross-office um, teammates together to create that culture of respect that we initiated three years ago. Um, and we do award students for two service learning hours for the completion of that asynchronous um, experience. Um, the purpose of that is because when we talk about the seven best practices of service learning, kind of to which you were speaking about in terms of the nature of the service learning program, um, there are seven best practices that um, the Maryland State Department of Education has identified that our service learning projects have to meet. And the very first one is meeting that community need. Um, so that community need, when you think about the nature of culture of respect, is creating that welcoming, um, respectful community of student learners and the community within our schools. And that was the community need that that particular um, service, sorry, that particular learning experience uh, meets. When we talk about the financial literacy piece, oftentimes we uh, think about that as how it promotes our own personal learning. Uh, but then how do we then take our personal learning and create um, some of these lessons um, that have been in development or already in development um, that are taking your personal learning in financial literacy um, and thinking about how we can create advocacy experiences to help take that information and, and push that out into the greater community to serve a need. Um, so when they're doing the asynchronous learning piece um, without having supervision of a direct instructor, uh, that might be the component where we would have to be very creative um, in identifying who would be that point of um, control there or to, to really review that the students have um, fully completed the expectations of those projects, whereas um, the culture of respect in completion because of that obtained knowledge and the community that it's meeting, um, we can already say with great success that the students have completed and satisfied the requirements. So that's kind of where the two um, are very similar in a light in terms of the asynchronous piece, but differ in terms of that, um, that 
review. So there isn't a teacher involved. It's just because you've gained that knowledge and you're going to apply that knowledge in your daily life that kind of meets the service requirement. For cultural respect, yes, because of the nature of the uh, content and the community that it meets versus the independent learning and financial literacy, yes, that definitely helps me as an individual. Um, but then how do I have to apply that to a greater community need? Because That's a different piece. Discussion on economic justice and in our communities of color. Right how that fulfills a service to our communities. Mrs. Majowski. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just very good. Turn it off. <laughs> one more thing? Yep, one more thing. Yeah. I promise one more thing. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, based on, on what you've shared, uh, Dr. Murphy and Dr. Pugh, I just wanted to, to ask, kind of the, just based on our conversation today, the way I would think about a, a reasonable approach to uh, some kind of financial literacy requirement, um, you know, the, the, the first I'll draw an analogy, and, and it's just one that, that I happen to understand, but um, the Maryland Seal of Biliteracy, uh, while it's one seal and, and, and uh, a number of students earn that seal, they all achieve it in different ways. Uh, so, so that's kind of the way I would see it as a financial, every student has to complete a financial literacy requirement that can either be achieved through a 0.5 course, through uh, an asynchronous module, through um, even, you know, we've talked about testing out, um, and, and you know, in the in whether it be the course of the module, perhaps you have opportunities for to earn SSL hours, uh, but but that is distinct from the financial literacy requirement itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to me, that that uh, addresses a number of the the concerns um, that have been shared around scheduling, around graduation equity, and and um, not not wanting to create barriers to graduation. Certainly, those are considerations that, regardless, will have to be uh, part of our conversation. But uh, to me, that that seems. Um, mm -hmm. To, to, to perhaps be a, a solution or a way to uh, kind of offer that uh, requirement. But I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts and reaction. Can you just um, summarize so it would be a, it would be required of all students. Yes. To, to choose one of the options. To choose any of them. Yes. But not necessarily for graduation. So in order to graduate, you have to check the box. You can check the box by It is a graduation a, requirement. Yeah. Right. But okay. uh, as opposed to being SL or following the SL box, following the box I'm of all courses. For that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. But you said you wanted staff reaction to Yes. I think that would uh, provide some clarity. Uh, in other words, it would be very clear and objective driven. I do think that we would, um, and I think the variation of how you achieve that would also allow students uh, across a broader continuum to be able to achieve that. I'm still concerned just about the time, and I'm also concerned about, um, you know, even with SSL hours now, uh, we are seeing, you know, as we uh, wrap up the school year, we still have a number of students that are trying to achieve that objective. I'd like to echo uh, Dr. Murphy's comments. I do like those options. Mr. Kim, I was over here nodding my head when you initially said that, um, because I do think we have to con continue to consider multiple paths to support our students, but we always, always have to, in our equity impact questions, always have to be able to answer whom does this serve and whom does this neglect. And so we, we just have to be very clear about that as we talk about the, re the requirement. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, for the module and the, the course, SSL, you know, having a, a student go through the module of the course and also earn a cell within itself can maybe uh, eliminate some barriers to graduation. Um, so, uh, so uh, another thought there. And, and just generally, again, I think this would really open the door to think about graduation and requirements in the future in a, in a different way. And, and um, uh, you know, as we, again, with the conversations around the CCR pathway, um, right. definitely aligns. Right. So those are thoughts. Thank you. Um, and just let us remember the equity issue, who is not going to get access mm -hmm. to this information because we are not um, facilitating the opportunity to get the financial literacy content. Ms. Wolf. I just have a question. I, I really like the way Mr. Kim is thinking about this. So if we were to think about doing different options to, to get this knowledge, would we be able to do this this year, or would this be something that we should study for another year and be prepared in 20, whatever the school, what's the next school year, 25 to, to work on? In my opinion, if you want it to be standards-based, 
And even though it's done in a variety of ways, a variety of methods, you still have to think about implementation of that. Um, I agree with Dr. Murphy's suggestion because we have only had one year of even studying the three courses we've created, and we've just created them. We have not had any students complete the online module. We don't know who will take it, who won't take it, and why. I still think there are a lot of questions for me because we don't have answers that aren't going to have great impact on students, and my fear is disproportionate. So a year um, to, to study and to really think through how do we make it actually be what it's supposed to be if we're making it a requirement that it's standards-based, that you know, it can't be you get a little bit and you get a lot. <laughs> um, I think that that needs work. And I, right now I don't have an answer without staffing, funding, <laughs> and, and <laughs> right, staffing, funding, and a, a way of monitoring to be sure and true to what it is that your desire is to say students have mastered this content. Not just had access, but they've mastered it and can do it. I, I, I like what Dr. Murphy said also, and I, and I like what Mr. Kim said, and I would be in favor of gathering another year's worth of data for it and then working on what we need to come up with it for the next school year after that. So just to clarify, that, that would be a graduation requirement that gives students multiple uh, options to, mm -hmm. to fulfill it. I, I, I said we, we get another year's worth of data and then we'll see where we're at, but I would propose that, yes, it could be a graduation requirement, but you have different pathways that you can mm -hmm. obtain that credit. Ms. Rivetta Oven? I, I am not opposed to being a, a graduation requirement, but from hearing what staff said, I, I'm still really concerned about the access of the students um, to be able to do that. The last thing I think I would like us to do is create another barrier for students who already have issues in having access to some of these modules. So for me, um, I would like to see the data. I would like to see who those kids are who are not Completing, I would like to know who are they. Yes, you know, ESOL students are. You know, so for me, there's still some unanswered questions about accessibility. Um, I'm all for, uh, you know, for monetary literacy, but again, I want us to be cautious, and I don't think, honestly, there needs to be a rush to make it a graduation requirement. Um, but if we don't have a way to evaluate it, if we don't have the staff, it doesn't sound like we have all our ducks in a row in order to be able to make sure that this is equitable in any shape or form. And I just want to uh, make sure that we do that. I would like to, as a new member of the board, um, get a list of all those SSL programs that we have. Um, just for my own knowledge, I think that would be really useful um, just to know what our students currently <coughs> can get SSL hours for. And if any of those um, are required or, or are, are available in other languages, um, to be able to, to complete them. Thank you. Um, and just something I recall from last year's discussion, um, all students have to take four years of math. And, um, you know, some of our EMLs who don't start with algebra in ninth grade, uh, the, the math, the fourth year of math, the, the financial math, what's it called, is an option for many students, but some of the EMLs um, don't get to that course even. So, so anyway, so the data, I think, especially for some of our, our new board members, is helpful to see who is accessing um, what. So again, um, I think as we conclude, Ms. Kim. oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Kim. Yes, yes, um, I am also very interested to have further data before we uh, made any decision because we just built out or is still building this online module that it has not fully implemented, been fully implemented in our school yet. So it will be a valuable data when we have to evaluate what are some different pathways, um, how to make it work. So I think this is a very viable option to explore. Thank you. And I had one final comment I just wanted to add on. Um, thank you for your openness just about this because this is really important and it, because it's impacting students in a really big way. We have to be clear about that. But 
The other reason um, I wanted to circle back, because Mr. Kim said this first, is this is also our first year of launching the college career and community readiness with the competencies and the experiences. So as I said in my opening comments, this, the experiences and the competencies were developed around what the priorities are of the experiences that we want students to get from elementary all through high school. So I think that's a, a very natural way to include that in this whole system of like qualifications that we want students to have who graduate from MCPS through that pathway so it doesn't exist as something separate. But that is the center and body of the work of what we want to have as a profile of a student graduating from MCPS. And I think this priority fits squarely into that um, in terms of the competencies and experiences. And being next year, being the first year that we implement that, uh, we can actually um, focus in on that piece around financial literacy. Thank you. Um, so just to conclude this conversation, we do have a motion and a second to let this lie on the table until the next board meeting. Uh, we had, uh, so all in favor, please raise your hands. And that is uh, Mr. Kim, myself, Mrs. Wolf, Ms. Rivetta Oven, and Ms. Yang. All opposed? No, they're gone. <laughs> Thank you for the conversation. Again, as you can see, there's great interest on the board to have every student MCPS uh, take part of this information on financial literacy, and we're looking for creative solutions to make sure that that happens. Thank you. So we are moving on to our next agenda item. Uh, we're going to uh, skip the recess and move on to uh, agenda item number nine. Uh, Dr. McKnight, if you could please proceed with our two agenda items, 9.1 and 9.2. Absolutely. So thank you. Um, we are going to discuss in this section of the agenda the traditional innovative school calendar modifications. Um, recently, we were notified by the State Board of Elections that there is going to be a primary election day held on May 14th, which we had not planned for in our initial calendar discussion. And so the state law does require that primary and general election days consider, uh, to be considered as holidays for students and staff. So given that recommendation um, and also budget constraints, we have to come back and look at the school calendar um, and address a few things as it relates to that. So um, unfortunately, the necessary budget reductions uh, that we are required to make no longer able to allow us to implement the three professional development days that we talked about earlier when we were discussing out of school time. So we now have to take that into consideration and the team is prepared today to come forward and talk about um, calendar decisions and how we've engaged to get feedback from others. So with that, um, I will turn it over to, wait a minute now, hold on a second. I just realized I skipped, I skipped and started talking about 9.2, pardon me. Let me back up for just a second. So I won't, so I won't actually tell you 9.2. Let me back up for a second. Before we get to that, we're going to talk about virtual instruction. <laughs> My apologies. Um, so we actually uh, had gotten some information that um, the Maryland State Department of Education did reopen a pathway for schools to be able to repurpose our inclement weather days, um, which you were aware. And the board and MSDE approved our plan that we had submitted for virtual learning days. So they're allowing us to submit virtual plans earlier. If you remember, we've normally done this like in the fall, but they're allowing us a process to be able to submit the plan earlier. So we wanted to take advantage of that and bring that forward to you today. Um, and I know that a number of offices have worked together on this, the academic office, office of strategic initiatives and operations on the impact overall of when we have to um, use possible virtual learning days when we have inclement weather and situations that we had not planned for. So um, we're excited they're going to share the virtual day instruction plan. And then after that, then we will go and talk about uh, the other parts of the calendar that I've already, already discussed. I'll turn it over to you. Good evening, uh, doc, uh, Dr. McKnight, uh, President Silvestri, and Dr. McKnight, thank you for your enthusiasm about the calendar. We were ready either way. Um, so we come to you uh, sharing some information. As Dr. McKnight said, the state has really done us a great favor and asked for us to consider the 
the application for the option to use synchronous virtual instruction um, in advance. So we can put forward our application this year um, to really be able to be better suited to prepare for next year. The one interesting thing is we've done this plan two years in a row, and thank goodness we've never had an opportunity to use it, but we like to be prepared. So if we go to the next slide, we just want to review with you what we have done in previous years to kind of really prepare and really be mindful around it. Um, really taking in mind just that continuity of learning, the academic professional and operational excellence, and then the readiness around communication has been really, really huge. And so we did introduce this year our six operating status and color codes to really be able to have a really quick visual way for everyone to know the operating status of the school system. And we have been green this year. So again, we eagerly await to be able to utilize what we have heard so much about that has really been an upgrade for us. Next slide. So the plan that we share with you today, as I share, is not new. Um, we've put it together. We've worked with uh, stakeholders. We've heard feedback about it in terms of really being able to be notified in advance, um, the readiness that's needed, and also having that time um, available in the morning. And so we thank those that were be able to be able to do that with us and really thinking about it. As we have um, looked at the feedback we've had in, um, in the past and really um, taken into account the feedback that we received this year, it's really about that clarity of communication. We have the operating status colors that are there. Um, no earlier um, as much as possible and where the info, um, where's info. And then the second component that we really have to think about because we are doing it earlier than what we have done before is, and this is a different spin, how we will communicate it. And really being thoughtful and mindful around, we have almost a larger runway of a year in advance, but prepping ourselves in a different way to really be able to do that. One of the things that you will hear today, and we talked about this, it was just back in January, we've expanded our food distribution and access sites, which we're really happy about to be able to have that resource available to students should we ever have to move into a virtual instructional plan. Dr. Pugh, if you could share the specific requirements provided from MSDE. Sure, next slide, please. So actually, this came about this option right after the pandemic and everybody was like, well, we should never have another snow day because we just did school online for a very long time. Um, but different districts interpreted that differently and so the state actually came up with some guidelines to make sure that we're all playing by the same rules. So the rules are listed there. Uh, our plan actually says that it will be no more than eight days in a school year um, and, there, and that the synchronous days, it gives a timeline of, of how long it needs to be. Um, it also requires that attendance be taken and for that reason, we're not looking at the asynchronous options at this time. Uh, the virtual plan, as part of today, has to be presented publicly at a board meeting, and then it has to have an opportunity for feedback, for people to share what their concerns might be, for us to then build into the plan and bring back for approval by the Board of Education. Once the Board of Education approves the plan, then we can submit our application for next year, next school year, winter of next school year, hopefully, um, for approval. Next slide. So this says snow day because every time we talk about a school closure, we think of a snow day, but it doesn't necessarily have to be snow. And so we just really want to emphasize and really um, think about, bless you, that any time we are considering any type of holistic system closure, we do take into account a couple of things, even when we're using our operating status. And so we only look at uh, closing our schools when necessary um, and after careful review. And a couple of things we do um, take into mind. We do uh, sink in with national and local weather experts so that we understand what is actually occurring, the weather systems, how long it will be, the impact on our area 
area. We collaborate and communicate with our local emergency um, officials at the um, Montgomery County level. And we really consider the operating status of our government uh, agencies and neighboring school districts. And we have to bear in mind the accessibility to our locations. And so I did want to bring that up because traditional snow days don't go away. Our calendar has 182 days in it, and there are two days that we build in um, just as buffer. So it gives us an opportunity to really be able to think about it because MSDE requires that we have 180 days. And so this option would provide us the opportunity to still have snow days, and we, we heard that that is very important. But also, if in a situation we have a multi-day event, a blizzard, um, multiple days when our locations are not accessible, that we could look at offering virtual learning to our students um, during that particular time. Next slide. And so purple means virtual learning day. Um, and so because MSDE has provided us this opportunity to apply this year, um, we really want to think about it's that getting ready method. And one of the things that was really important as we built this plan, we listened to people around it, and still to this point is people just want to know in advance. So we cannot say right now that a virtual learning day will be tomorrow. Students staff and family said they do need more time. So a part of that that we made a commitment around, and that's really important, is at least by noon the day before is when we would make that decision that provides people an opportunity to take their resources home and for them to be able to have that information. We would also look at how we disseminate that information through all of our platforms, through email, text message, our website, our social media, and that would cause us to shift the color, um, the color instructional into the virtual instruction. And then we are also looking at how we share that information through our individual school websites. As I shared earlier, the piece about the how, we have a nice little runway in front of us. So this gives us an opportunity to provide our school's messages to put in their back to school um, information in terms of when virtual instruction would happen. Also looking at loading that color-coded operational status onto our individual school websites. Our families have shared with us that when they want information, they usually sink into the school websites first. And so we want to make that a hub and an area where they can access that. So we are working to upgrade that and to make that connected with the larger Montgomery County website. The third piece is we're looking at how we actually put a QR code in place so people can scan that and that will take them to the operating status so that they would have that information. And then really being thoughtful around the connected messages that our schools send out during the school year that will go to students as well as staff and families to talk about the weather-related um, information, operational status. And one thing I'm really excited about is doing some mini videos, kind of the TikTok time frame, um, in multiple languages, just to kind of engage people around, really thinking about and knowing what our status is at that particular time, as well as virtual instruction. So I want to shift to Ms. Sharon just to share some information about the access to technology and materials um, th for this virtual option. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. So as we've stated before, in the Office of Strategic Initiatives, our goal is to make sure that technology is not a barrier, but actually an accelerator to equity throughout the district. So, oh, I'm sorry, go to the next slide, please. So we will continue the practices that are already underway uh, right now that we have that we have been working on. We'll continue to work on um, internet connectivity for our families at home. Um, we will continue to uh, provide one-to-one -one devices. We have already provided this year um, options for families to have a extra Chromebook at home if their if their child, um, especially in the elementary school, is on a cart model where they don't take the Chromebook back and forth. We will continue with that. We have provided charger 
structures and opportunities for staff to be able to quickly convert if we are in a situation where the, they have to take the Chromebooks out. Um, and the schools at this point are very well versed in how to do that. We will be continuing um, with web conferencing um, opportunities. Canvas will also still be a tool that we are using in order to engage collaboratively. And then we're going to be continuing with our learning opportunities and support for families. So similarly to what Ms. Edwards said around providing communication in advance, part of that communication plan that's going to start during back to school time will be how are you all, how do you make sure that you're ready in the just in case scenario? And that communication will be for schools, staff, and our community. Thank you. Next slide. So this was a point when we discussed in January, we had not had an opportunity to really build out what the expanded meal service would look like. We had just received notification from the state that we would be able to shift into a grab and go model. Um, and so we worked with a, um, a design team uh, led by Rachel Du Bois and Barb and DFNS, with many of our principals, security staff, and some of our community uh, resources to really think about what that grab and go distribution would look like. So I'm I'm more excited, I think, than anybody to try to implement this plan. So I'm kind of looking forward to some inclement weather. I'm probably the only one, <laughs> but um, we have identified 20 school sites geographically throughout Montgomery. County that would provide us an opportunity to offer meal service to our students should we need to be closed for virtual instruction and or if we have a snow day. As long as we can get to those sites, as long as there's electricity, um, and as long as we can deliver the food there for students to be able to come and pick up. The key important factor for us is that we did not want any appointments um, for anyone to be able to come and just to kind of be able to be open. So when we make the announcement around schools being open or closed and what status, we will also be able to share which food sites will be available for children to be able to come to. We do recognize, though, that sometimes schools may not be the places that some families want to come. So we have connected with the women who care um, to be able to offer an opportunity for families to still be able to access food in a different way um, other than just through the actual distribution sites at our school locations. Next slide. And so some of this sounds very familiar because we sat here in January and spoke about it. There were some upgrades and highlights that um, we do bring forward. And again, very grateful for the state providing us the opportunity. And we just want to um, narrow us into that. Our traditional snow days are not going away. We still have that option. But this just does provide us another opportunity to really think about for a year where we may need to take more days than what we have done over the last couple of years. This just does protect the last day of school for us. It gives us an opportunity to think about and utilize our opportunities to reach instruction in a different way and really limit those disruptions to instruction, which we know do happen as a result of weather. And we know continuous instruction is really important. We want to be um, mindful of making early notification and preparation and support our students, staff, and families. And this would help us to ensure that we do close school on June 13th and not have any elongated time at the end of the year. So we do want to open it up for discussion and questions from the board. Um, and then after that, there is a resolution. And that resolution just provides us the opportunity to then turn the application into the state for them to review and approve. So thank you. Ms. Roberta Oven. Just very quickly. Um, so I'm a parent in CPS. Uh, by noon, you decide that you're going to be doing virtual uh, teaching the next day. Am I going to get a text? Is that one of your ways of communicating? Yes. Oops. So we'll be text, and we're also going to be launching Remind 101, which is currently underway. Uh, that we'll be definitely utilizing for situations such as this, and that comes in multiple languages as well. Okay, and uh, the other question I had is, could we have a list of the 20 sites for the, for the food distribution? Yes, that's not a problem. Mr. Kim. 
Thank you. I don't know if it's because we were talking about the budget or financial literacy or because I took the microeconomics exam last week, <laughs> but I'm thinking about this in, in like a, like a cost-benefit uh, analysis way. And, and uh, you know, my, my biggest concern is that, that just the, the, the cost or the risks this poses around equity of access, around the, the, uh, the, uh, the ask it is of, of educators for that turnaround, um, for, for the students who just, despite our efforts, just might not be able to, to access uh, instruction on those days, just outweighs any benefit that we could extract uh, from one additional day of instruction, uh, especially when it's impeded by uh, th those costs or, or those considerations. Uh, the one use case I do see uh, this providing the most benefit is those, not that we've had one, but uh, you know, if there was like a week of school that we could anticipate uh, because, because of snow or, or then, it, I think it makes a lot of sense. And even if there is a learning curve with instruction for the first day, day and a half, it, it might, uh, you know, students might have trouble accessing. Eventually, you get to the point where, where you're really able to uh, engage students in a meaningful way. I don't think in, in those, those one days, uh, you know, those one day scenarios that, that this uh, poses enough benefit to take those risks around equity specifically. Um, and, you know, the parameters I see in the plan, I mean, there definitely is some, some, um, Discussion about considering uh, it as part of a multi-day inclement weather event um, with prior preparation and communication, but uh, the way I see this as it is right now, it just it leaves too much room to to pose those risks and concerns. Um, so th that, those are my thoughts right now. I, I did want to ask a couple of questions around those concerns in specific. The first round uh, access uh, around equity of technology. Uh, the the big concern obviously being you know um, students who are still on the cart model, so they don't. Uh, might not have access at home. Um, do you have any like grasp, a number you could share around how students are, are able to access? Currently, right now, we have 30,000 elementary students that have a Chromebook at home um, in addition to what they use at school. Um, so I can give you that number. Um, as far as connectivity, we have about 99% um, of our families from, from what we, data we have collected who have the connectivity. Um, what's important to note though, even in those Chromebook schools where they have, they're on the CART model, they, we also have provisioned every single school with enough quick chargers to be able to check out for the kids that don't have something at home as well. So there's, there's multiple provisions in that. Thank you. And, and the second question I have is around the, the turnaround time, noon the day before. Is that a time you're able to kind of, you know, engage teachers as stakeholders and, and, and kind of reach and just want to hear uh, how you're able to engage in that way? Absolutely. We actually came up with noon the day before um, talking to our teachers and staff members as well as um, uh, at that time, students, because just like Ms. Sharon said, it's the component around, one, the technology. Teachers really felt like they wanted to have all of their materials ready um, and not leave anything in the building. Um, noon the day before does provide us the opportunity, one, all of those pieces I talked about, just in understanding the weather, understanding what's happening in Montgomery County, but also doing some touch bases into our schools and then the different geographic parts of the district. So um, we do not make those decisions lightly. Um, if we're coming up on really thinking about virtual instruction, it goes back to the point you said, um, we're looking at trying to do it for a multi-day event. Um, and so we would be engaging not only across the system at the central level, but also thinking about our schools, as well as getting information from some of our community um, members as well. So we just want to have that level of prepare. So thank you for asking that. So you said the, the plan that you're presenting today, the only time that it will be implemented is with a multi-day event. We look, we not only time, but that would be one of the main reasons that we would implement it. Um, it could be a time when there's a singleton event, but those multi-day events create a stretch of time that really kind of create um, more of an opportune space. I, I, I think... Yes, Mr. Kim, I just wanted to emphasize that early on. Um, I, I think when we look at these options, and I know it's hard to imagine because we haven't had a snowmageddon in, in, in a while, but it really does come to, if we're in a situation, you know, in which we have a multi-day event in which we're giving people time to prepare that we would implement something like this. And for the purpose of, if, if it is weather, let's say it's snow or whatever it may be, we know that uh, folks are impacted normally on the first day just trying to get themselves organized around what the situation is, whether it may be shoveling to get those 
going out to still have to go to work or um, whether it's, you know, taking care of siblings, all those types of things. So we do take that into consideration, recognizing the, you know, different families need different things. Thank you. And I certainly agree. I, I think that's, uh, again, why I see multi any multi-day impediment in, in instruction being really the only place that, that this could could bring enough value to, to be able to, to take those risks around equity and the turnaround. And, and um, for me, that that's uh, what, I, what I would have liked to see in, in a plan is, is, is really a, a stronger commitment to only um, taking those considerations and, and take, considering um, virtual instruction when uh, you have a, a multi-day event that you can uh, predict ahead of time. There's one more example that I do want to share, and I want to say it was year before last. It was also a COVID year. Uh, but we were also in a situation, <laughs> looking, at, it was a COVID year, where we were experiencing like a closing every week for like three, three, four weeks in a row. Um, now, while that's not a multi-day event altogether, um, I do think if we have a situation like that and we're getting close to running out of days, then we do have to take into consideration and can alert and communicate to our community, okay, we're out of days. You know, we've gone through one day increments over three weeks. You know, we may have to implement this, you know, in the case to not extend the school year, you know, uh, that then impacts people in different ways as well. So I, I wanted to throw that out as another example also. And I think that's valuable. I, uh, again, I, even in those situations, I, I think just the, I mean, the, you know, you have to meet the, the requirement uh, for the number of days in the school year. That that's that. But I just don't think students are, are engaging in educational uh, in their ed education in a meaningful way. Uh, if we're just you know having virtual days for the sake of meeting that requirement, I, I think um, the the biggest service we can do them is is whether it be by by unfortunately having the school year pass uh, the um, uh, planned date. Um, that that's the the, the, bit, the best thing uh, I think we do in those situations, um, and even then, um, having a, if it's where you need to make up like five six days, then I, I think it, it makes reasonable sense. But but um, that, that that's kind of my, my what, what I struggle with right now. Just to well, be clear, I want to follow up on Mr. Kim's thing. So this is not designed for the school that has a water main break when you break, wake up in the morning, school's closed for the day, right? I think we want to be very clear about this, that. This is, this, is a being, this is applied for whole system operational need. Yes, you're exactly correct. Um, those intermittent individual school components, we want to be very thoughtful around. Um, we purposefully kind of design the color code system to align with this to be able to help. So I appreciate that clarification. Ms. Yang. So I think as a school system, um, it's always better that we are more prepared, better prepared, have different ways that we can handle um, unexpected event like 10 days in 20, 2010, was it that we have it? And the state have to wait five days of school days. Mm -hmm. And um, just like a family, when we know there's something coming up, we stock up on a lot of um, material and necessities. I see it, this give us another way to prepare uh, for those unexpected uh, events. Okay. If there are no further questions, I think there's a resolution. There is a resolution. Thank you. And thank you for the discussion and questions. Whereas virtual learning provides an opportunity for continuity of instruction on days when school buildings are closed due to inclement weather, and whereas the Maryland State Department of Education, building on the success of the opportunity provided in the 2021, 2022, and 2022, 2023 school year, has opened a pathway for local education agencies to repurpose certain days as virtual learning days in the 2023-2024 school year, and whereas synchronous virtual learning on inclement weather days counts toward the 180 days of instruction required each school year by the state of Maryland, and whereas the adopted 
2024 traditional and innovative school year calendars included stakeholder input and have additional built-in inclement weather days and contingency makeup days. And whereas the Board of Education approved a framework in virtual learning days when it was introduced by the Maryland State Department of Education during the 2021-2022 school year, and whereas the same framework exists in the 2023 2024 school year plan and has been updated. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the virtual day instruction plan aligns with the parameters established by Maryland State Department of Education and be it further resolved that upon approval from the Maryland, Maryland State Department of Education, the superintendent of schools may use discretion when transitioning to virtual learning on days when school buildings are closed to inclement weather or other days that may interrupt regular regular in-person in operations. Can I get a motion to approve? Can I get a motion? So move. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's Ms. Yang, Ms. Roberta Oven, Ms. Wolf, and myself. All against, raise your hand. Mr. Kim, so we do not have uh, five votes to move this forward. Um, so we will. Point of order. Do you need five votes to move it forward? I thought it was just a majority of a quorum. Yeah, it's The quorum is met then a simple majority of the present body. That's my understanding. <laughs> we have a quorum. I voted against it, so you know I'm not lying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You're on your way out, so. No, no, no. Do we have a? We have a quorum to vote. <laughs> and Our and parliamentarian, Miss yeah. Miss Seabrook. Yeah, I, I think that that's right. That's right. That's a majority. Majority of the quorum. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Kim. Motion passes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we can move on to we'll the move. next item, yes. 9.2. Yes, we're moving right into everything I said earlier and taking into consideration <laughs> yes. the new election day. So the second calendar item we have in, um, in front of us today is the calendar modification. Um, the calendar modification is a result of, um, as Dr. McKnight shared, um, the State Board of Elections identifying a primary election day. And so that primary election day that has been identified um, is in May, and we did not learn about this until April 28th. So this was way after we had approved our initial calendar, which was at the end of December. So we are coming back to you today um, for two reasons um, and two modifications. One, with the addition of the election day on May... <clears throat> May 14th, um, it does take away one day of instruction. So it would take us from 182 to 181. So we definitely want to make sure that we identify another day of instruction to be able to support the, the learning needs of our students because we utilize our schools for polling places. And so we do not want to interfere with that process in any way. The second component is Mr. Hall Dr. McKnight, as well as Mr. Riley, talked to the board earlier about um, the removal of the out-of-school time days or the PDI days is what we called them. And we had three days within the calendar. We had November 10th that we were using for high schools. February 16th that we were using for middle schools, and we also had May 15th that we were using for elementary schools. So as a result of the budget decisions, um, those three days have been removed from the calendar, and they'll be full instructional days, full school days um, across the system. So those are the two reasons why we're taking a look at this calendar modification now. As we shared back in December when we looked at the calendar, we wanted to come, have our calendar set, but 
here I am again, and I'm loving just the conversation we're having. So um, there were a couple of days we looked at um, just uh just to be very honest, um, the state does require, like I said, 180 instructional days. In our conversation we just had, we use 182. We have our two-day buffer, you know, for snow days, and we want to, um, for excuse me, inclement weather days, and we do want to make sure that we keep that. We re-examined the feedback that we heard um, initially around our calendar to really be thoughtful around what days that we want to really look at that we would move a professional development day into an instructional day. Um, and so there were three major dates that we looked at. We looked at October 9th. Um, we also looked at February 16th and we looked at April 22nd. And what we narrowed into in terms of looking at the feedback that we heard around our original calendar also, um, listening to stakeholders again around this calendar um, that we're talking about, October 9th is a great professional development day. It's the beginning of the year. We're at the middle part of the quarter. It creates an opportunity for really good system-wide PD. And if one thing that we do know about our calendar is it, it, it's really clean instructionally in terms of just continuity. Um, the second date, um, I'm going to actually jump to April 22nd because what you see up there is our recommendation. April 22nd still serves as a professional development day. Um, and the reason why is when we thought about PD, especially taking out those out of school time days, we wanted some really nice bookends in terms of system wide PD. In the very beginning, toward the end of the year, and then really using that middle part of the year for some really micro learning within the individual schoolhouses and throughout the system to be able to support folks. We also heard on April 22nd, our students like that day, they're preparing for AP and IB exams. And so for them, that's an, an uninterrupted day. They're not in classes. They can really take the opportunity to be able to utilize that and prepare for their exams. So that took us to February 6th, 16th. And February 16th, um, the recommended um, calendar that we have for the board today, we do have it white on the screen, but at one point it was a professional development day, and it's connected to the 19th, which is President's Day. So that day always served as a question mark for us because we thought about attendance, if people were going to take an elongated weekend, and the other component around the 16th is February is a short month. So that took away two instructional days for us already at that point. Um, and so it's during the winter and we always have the question mark and we just had, are we getting a blizzard or not? Um, and so the 16th served as an opportune time to really think about using that date as an instructional day, and then going back to how we share this with people because we have a good runway. And so some people may not notice it, many people will, but how do we prepare in advance and kind of start messaging this information um, so that folks are aware that that 16th has now transitioned into um, an instructional day. So what we bring to you today really takes um, into account continuous instruction, trying to create that opportunity. We did learn about the election day late. Um, there's nothing that we can do about that. However, we wanted to be thoughtful around how we approached really selecting a day um, that would give back a day of instruction to restore us to 182 instructional days, but also bear in mind um, the fact that we did remove the out of school time, those additional professional development days, but really thinking about we still have the bookends of PD at the beginning and the end of the year. So I'll turn it over to the board for discussion and questions. And then, yes, I have another resolution um, to be able to read. Colleagues, any questions or comments? Ms. Yang. Did I miss the proposed date? Do you, did you oh, propose yeah. the date? I'm so sorry. Yes, I propose February 16th. February 16th. Um, changing it. Currently, it is a professional development day. 
but changing that 16th to an instructional day, not only on our traditional calendar, but also on our um, ISY calendar as well, so that we have some parity. Mr. Kim. And then, could you speak to the changes on the November 10th and the February 15th as well? Absolutely. When we brought our calendar forward in December, um, we wanted to look at ways to be innovative, one. But two, we also were bearing in mind some of the requirements of the blueprint and really enhancing that opportunity for professional development. Um, also aligning ourselves with many of the things um, that we heard at the last board presentation around PD for staff um, directly connected with our anti-racist action plan. And so we implemented, uh, we actually input three days of professional development. It was uh, November 10th, February 16th, and May 15th um, throughout our calendar. And we were looking at those as tiered days. So on November 10th, it would have been an opportunity for our high school um, staff to be able to have PD but our high school students would experience um, community learning opportunities. Um, and so that would also count as a day of instruction. We wouldn't lose that day, but it was our way to one, differentiate the needs of our high school staff and students, but then also think about a way to be able to leverage our calendar as a really good opportunity to do that. Am I misremembering that February 15th was non-instructional for some reason? I'm sorry, February. You are not. Um, February fifteenth was the non was the um, the out of school time day, and then February sixteenth was a professional development day. Yes. And then November tenth was just the November tenth um, was a regular out of school time professional development day. Nope, you are absolutely correct, Mr. Kim. I appreciate I appreciate your uh, memory. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, um, it seems like our hands are tied, but uh, you know, I, I think I've spoken to a lot of students who are really excited, and and that that four days in, in the middle of February it meant a lot. Um, so you know, as we consider calendars in the future, um, you know, that I, I think I remember hearing a lot of feedback about like the turn of the third quarter, the beginning, just being a really long stretch. So uh, you know, as you consider next year's calendar, I won't be considering it, but as you consider it, um, that's certainly a, a piece of feedback to continue to consider. Thanks, Mr. Kim, and also thank you for letting us speak to your group. Um, they were very helpful in terms of giving us just some food for thought and ways to approach this that really bear in mind the needs of students. I'm glad. And we'll keep your feedback in mind as well. Okay. I think you can do the resolution. Absolutely. Whereas the Maryland State Board of Elections designated May 14th, 2024 as a holiday for primary election day, and whereas in order to maintain 182 instructional days for students, a previously scheduled non-instructional day must now be designated for instruction, and whereas budget constraints make it necessary to realign funds previously allocated for professional development, slash instructional days, now therefore be it resolved that the 2023-2024 traditional and innovative school year calendars be modified to identify May 14th, 2024 as a holiday and November 10th, 2023, February 15th, 2024, February 16th, 2024, and May 15th, 2024, be identified as instructional days for all staff and students, and be it further resolved that the proposed modifications to the Montgomery County Public Schools 2023-2024 traditional and innovative school year calendars be adopted. So move. Second. Okay. Any further questions or discussion? Okay. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous with those present. Thank you. Okay, we can move on to our next agenda item, item 10, which is the preliminary plans presentation for Greencastle Elementary School. Dr. McKnight. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Silvestri. So we are, are inviting the guests to the table. We are discussing Greencastle Elementary School addition project. I am welcoming to the table um, Ms. Shabasaki, our Assistant Director of Facilities, Principal Rob Opsgarden from Principal of Greencastle Elementary School, and our um, 
architect who is working on the project. So welcome to the table. Uh, so good evening, uh, President Sylvester, members of the board, and uh, Dr. <coughs> McKnight. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the uh, prelim preliminary plans uh, for very important project in Northeast Consortium uh, Green Castle Elementary School. So with me tonight, uh, we have the principal, Robert uh, Obst Obstgarden, and the architect of the project, uh, Ms. Donna Rosano from Profit and associate architect. And just to give you a little bit of background of this project, uh, because we have been advocating for this project for many years, and due to the fluctuations in enrollment, uh, it has been on and off of funding over the course of several years. And but tonight, uh, we have uh, this project is now funded and presenting the five classroom addition. Uh, that will serve 705 students when the construction is completed in summer of 2025. And this uh, project also includes some of the site improvements, including like ADA accessibility. And uh, since this addition uh, project, uh, since this is the addition project, um, the big part of the plan is to work with the school and the uh, neighboring communities to make sure that the construction, uh, how we can construct while the students are on site, because this is very important topic. So we are working with uh, all the stakeholders to have this, um, this opportunity to explore all the options for this design and how we can communicate with the school community and the surrounding communities. Um, so now I will be turning over to the principal to share a little bit about the community and then um, about you know, what this capital improvement uh, means to them. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, I definitely want to thank you all for your consideration. Um, it really means a lot to our community um, and the Northeast Consortium to know that our needs are being strongly considered and have the possibility of some funding being dedicated for um, the needs that our community definitely has. Um, as some brief background about why this project is so important, um, in the five years I've been at Greencastle, the number of portable classrooms that we have has risen from six to ten. Um, at this point, our entire fourth and fifth grade are all outside in portable classrooms. Um, our seven kindergarten classrooms inside the building do not have restrooms inside their classrooms because when the building was constructed, the rooms that were initially designed for kindergarten have since been reallocated for our PEP and pre-K program. So our 650 K-5 to students are all sharing four pairs of restrooms within the entire building, which I'm sure you can imagine gets a bit crowded. Uh, we have a number of staff who are working out of converted closets, um, trying to be creative with our space usage. Uh, we have staff that are sharing spaces that are not meant for that much usage. Um, as two examples, uh, one office that is meant for one person is currently being shared by our two parent community coordinators, as well as a food pantry that they are trying to design that we started up this year. Um, there's another space that is shared by both linkages to learning and instrumental music. Um, again, a small room that is meant for one that we're trying to be as creative as possible. Um, in the five years I've been at Greencastle, our percentage of students on free and reduced meals has risen exponentially. Uh, when I started there, we were at around 58%. Next year, we're at close to 80%, uh, which really speaks to some of the need in our community. And we've been very fortunate to have other resources come to support our families and our students. Um, as I mentioned, we've started up a food pantry. We'll be getting some additional linkages to learning staff next year. Next year, we're becoming a community school and having a community school liaison and everything great that, is in, that comes along with that. But obviously, with all those resources, there's the need for space for those resources to be able to operate as effectively as possible. Um, so those are just some of the reasons why this project is so vitally important for our community. Um, and on behalf of the entire Greencastle community, I truly want to thank you all for your consideration this evening. Thank you. And then now I'm turning over to uh, Ms. Donner to present and walk through the uh, project. Uh, thank you all for your time this evening. We appreciate the opportunity to present. Uh, you have my slideshow that's up. So uh, the existing building, as you can see in this uh, site aerial, 
There has been no significant additions or improvements to this school uh, since it was built, so we are looking to put a large addition towards the front of the building that would front on Roby Road, which is the main access road running diagonally across the photograph. And uh, as part of this, as she have mentioned, we are also looking at doing some accessibility improvements in the site to provide an accessible route from Roby Road to the, the new main entrance of the building and the new bus loop entrance. We'll be modifying the parking area for additional accessible parking spaces as well as the configuration of the bus loop. We're also working towards eliminating one of the four entrances off of Irby Road so that we can cut down on the pedestrian vehicular traffic configuration. Um, as Rob mentioned, there are several portables. You can see those on uh, what was the existing paved play area that's to the right of the building outside of the gym? And then the ball fields, it's hard to tell in this photo, but those actually dropped down um, a large slope to the ball fields below. And there was a paved play and soft play area added two summers ago, I believe, right? Yeah, that's just next to the parking area. So those, the new paved play and soft play will stay in place, but we hoping to relocate some of those portables off site so that we can gain back some of the existing paved play outside of the gymnasium. Let me go to the next slide. Next slide. I, just, I don't know who has control. <laughs> I don't know where to look to. So just quickly, this is um, uh, the floor plan for the existing building. Uh, the majority of it in, um, is on the first floor, or is on a single floor. On the left-hand side of the building, the green is the existing admin suite. The dark purple is the existing, they were designed as kindergarten classrooms. They are currently being utilized as PEP classrooms. Uh, that are just below that, uh, the admin suite, the red area is the existing multi-purpose room, kitchen, and platform area. In the middle, in yellow, is the existing media center. Uh, and then across the front, in the light purple, is actually kindergarten classrooms. Several of those were designed as specials classrooms originally, the music, dual purpose, and art room. The art room is the one sole survivor there in green because it has the kiln. The rest of those have been repurposed. Uh, and then the four purple classrooms atop of the gym are being used as kindergarten, but as Rob mentioned, those were originally designed as uh, typical classrooms, so they have no restrooms in them. The gym is the large blue area in the middle, and then towards the back, we have some standard classrooms, and surrounding the gym and all of the classrooms is a second story of additional uh, typical classrooms that, that we've pulled out there. Those are all in the orange color. Next slide. So this is quickly just a proposed site plan. So as you can see in the blue, we're looking to put an addition onto the front of the building. We're proposing the red area that is the current admin. We're trying to limit the amount of demolition to the building. Uh, we're around 1,200 to 1,300 square feet of true demolition. The remainder of that we are gonna be renovating, keeping the existing structure and roof and doing renovation work to maintain as much as we can of the existing building. Uh, so that's why it's in red. And we also have an alternate for uh, some renovations at the media center. The lighter blue area on the addition is um, the linkages to learning area, which we always uh, track separately as an alternate as well for funding purposes. Um, because of the, the addition, we're going to have a nice frontage along Roby Road that gives a better presence for any vehicular traffic coming into the school. We will be reconfiguring the bus loop a little bit to allow for more room, but again, that allows us to provide an accessible entrance into that route. We are also closing down one of the entrances to the main parking lot, widening the remaining entrance so that we can have designated turn lanes and ingress and egress, as well as um, revising the parking area to allow for an accessible route to the main entrance. Uh, the existing school right now, the, when it was built, the main entrance faced the parking area due to a security vestibule project um, several years ago. The entrance was actually relocated to what was the bus loop entrance, which has caused some confusion for any kind of visitors to the school because the uh, they come from the parking lot and can't use the main entrance. So we're proposing to relocate the main entrance back to the front of the school and utilize the bus entrance again for bus purposes. Next slide. So just quickly, just for a, another breakdown, this is the existing first floor plan. Um, so you can see where everybody is divided up. 
and um, classrooms ringing around the gymnasium, the media center and the multi-purpose room in the middle of the building, the PEP classrooms down along the left-hand side and the um, admin suite, health suite area all combined in that front corner piece. And the next slide. <clears throat> so again, this is what we're proposing for the first floor. We'd be pulling the admin suite to the front of the building, so that's going to be the dark green area. Extending the main entry so that it's closer to the parking area and has a more prominent location and is, can be seen better from the road and from the parking area. We're proposing three new kindergarten classrooms that are going to meet the current ed specs, as well as a new art room and music and instrumental music um, that will allow us to relocate those classrooms out of some of the other typical classrooms and have those convert back to typical classrooms and move kids away from the, the portable classrooms. And then in, interior to the renovation area, we have a lot of the support spaces and offices that don't necessarily need to have the direct um, natural light, We're trying to keep all of the classrooms to the perimeter so we can have windows for all of the students. As part of this, there would be an accessible restroom in the admin suite for staff. There's a student restroom in the health suite. Each of the kindergarten classrooms will have their own accessible, and we will have two inclusive uh, restrooms right in the middle next to the T1 resource just above instrumental music, one for students and one for staff. I just couldn't tell where you're Sure. At. They're, they're kind of hard to see because they're in different colors depending on where they're at. But we are actually, all of the toilets that we're adding will be accessible. Uh, there are no currently no accessible toilets in the building, so we're going to make sure that all of ours are accessible. These will all actually be single-user toilets as well. Um, like the two off of the hallway will be labeled as inclusive, and then we have three in the, one in each kindergarten classroom, uh, one in the health suite, and two in the admin suite per the ed spec, one for staff and then one off of the principal's office. We're also looking at additional restrooms on the second floor as well, which I think will be the next slide. <laughs> so these kindergarten classrooms here, Wait, maybe I'm, are they existing already? They are, they are existing classrooms that are being used for kindergarten. They are not, they were not designed as kindergarten classrooms. Okay, so you're, you Can have you three? I'm just trying to understand what I'm looking at. Sure. You have three right here, but didn't I hear you say you had seven kindergarten classes? We currently have seven. Yes, we currently have seven kindergarten classrooms, and next year we're projected to have six. Okay, but where, where are they on here? So our current kindergarten um, on there where you see the 4K and yeah. then down the hallway, pre-K and then classroom, 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 those three classrooms are currently all kindergarten as well. Okay, so what I'm just trying to understand, are you going to be renovating in those classrooms, the, the white ones that are K up there? There will be some limited renovation where we're converting some of the special classrooms that are there now into a, a, a usable classroom, so a, a typical classroom or a kindergarten classroom. So we will have some limited renovations. We are not proposing to put restrooms into those classrooms as part of this project. That's what I'm trying to figure out. If you've got six kindergarten classrooms, you've got six with bathrooms <coughs> when you finish. Six dedicated, we will have three dedicated kindergarten classrooms with restrooms, and then there will be the, the remaining four that will not have restrooms at this, as part of this project. And there are four existing PEP classrooms that do have restrooms in them. Yeah, I just uh, I have to think on that. That seems to me if we're, we're renovating and you've got <laughs> yeah. kindergarten so classrooms. Actually, because as a like, part of the long-term plan, uh, we because I think Mr. Adams mentioned about this during the CIP, but uh, the plan, long-term plan is uh, pre-K and PEP may move to the existing uh, Burtonsville Elementary School mm -hmm. site. And then so the PEP classroom will be vacant. And at that time, all the kindergarten classroom will have a bathroom. That could be five years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, you've got at least three or four kindergarten classes with no bathroom. Mm -hmm. You will have your kindergarten teachers take to take a draw out of a hat? Uh, well, because after <sighs> this project will be completed uh, summer of 2025, and the Burtonsville Elementary School uh, is anticipated to complete 2027. 
However, uh, as I think Mr. Adams also mentioned, if you know we can accelerate the project for one year, it I will guess be. What I'm thinking though is you, you've got kindergarten students; they can't walk down the hall by themselves. I mean, they've got to go find a bathroom. So you expect the classroom teacher to go out with them? No. So we, what we currently do with all of our kindergarten students, they always go in pairs because right now with our seven kindergarten classrooms, none of them have bathrooms right now. And you're absolutely right. For safety of students, we would never have any of our kindergarten students go by themselves. So sometimes a kindergarten teacher may take the whole class on a restroom break or other times if it's an individual need, they would send them in pairs. Okay. I, it just seems like a long time to me before Burtonsville will be built over on their new site for these classes to move out. And if you're doing renovations, I mean, I know money is limited, but I don't understand but why we aren't, couldn't do something in those bathrooms, do something in those class. Even if you put one between two classrooms. How much does it cost to add a bathroom? The, in terms of cost, um, it will be not too significant, but however, we have to put all the plumbing and stuff, for, and this is first floor, so we have to kind of like break the uh, existing concrete slabs and stuff like that. But you so already, you're going to be putting, you're already going to be putting uh, plumbing anyway for sinks and other things, right? Just over where the, the purple part is, where, not where the 4Ks are up there. Right. The, mm -hmm. the new plumbing will be under new slab and areas that we're already demolishing of the existing building. There are two group bathrooms uh, next off the hallway, right where it says RES for resource. There are two, bath two group bathrooms right there, so kind of right outside of the hallway. And then there's two more over by the gymnasium on the other side of the media center as well that I believe the kindergarten classrooms in the front there are using, utilizing now. Well, let's let you finish the presentation. We'll continue with our questions. Okay. Sure, sure. Uh, there's no more questions on the slide. We can go to the next slide. And again, as I mentioned, the the scope of work on the second floor is, is very limited. Those are all typical classrooms. All that we were looking to do there is, if we go to the next slide, um, right where at the end of the second story is, we're looking to add two gender-inclusive rest, single-user restrooms on the second floor as well. And those also would be fully accessible because there are no accessible restrooms up on the second floor. And the next slide. And then just some of uh, the elevations of the new addition. So we'd have the new main entrance next to the existing stair tower, and then the building angles off so it runs in alignment with Roby Road to give us better presence along uh, that street frontage. And then you can see the classrooms run along the Roby Road side, and then we have a new entrance for the bus loop. I think they'll be more readable in uh, some of the renderings or when we do the animation as well. It's a little easier to see the massing at that point. The next slide. So this is what we're proposing as uh, the new front entrance for the school. This is coming off of the reconfigured parking area. So that would be our new front entrance and canopy with uh, the admin suite uh, on that angled portion and uh, the conference room to the admin suite over in the corner. And the next slide. And then this is a uh, view coming driving down Roby Road. This would be the new addition that you'd see. So those would be the kindergarten classrooms running along the front there. And then at towards the end where the uh, profile pops up a little bit, that's where we have the art room and the admin suite starting down there. And the next slide. And this would be the new bus loop entrance with the uh, area that bumps out would be the linkages to learning. Sweet. So they would be coming in off of the bus loop, and we're looking at some designated parking for them off of the bus loop. I think that's all of the slides. There should be a separate file for the animation to the flyover. We are going to see the flyover? Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So basically, we, we started at the parking lot and um, going down towards the Roby Road side so you could see how it would front against the Roby Road and with the existing building behind it. I'm sorry. So 
But where's the handicap parking for that access to the front? It'll be in the new parking lot. There's, um, I think we have three or four designated spaces along the front, along with the EV parking that would be roughed in. On the front, in the bus loop, it will be inside the bus loop. And there's only going to be a couple of spaces. For linkages, one will be accessible. And that's all I have. Okay. Ms. Wolf. I, I, oh, I know it's still on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would like us to cost out what it would take to add more bathrooms in those K rooms, even if you added one bathroom between two different rooms that they could share. Mm -hmm. Because I, you know my belief is that this is in East County and I believe they deserve the same thing as everybody else gets in the county. Yeah, we will definitely look into it, yes. Thank you. Ms. Yang? Um, after the addition, the renovation, what would be the school capacity? Mm -hmm. Uh, 705 students. What is your current enrollment? Our current K-5 to enrollment is about 650. Next year we're projected at 633. Okay. Um, currently we also have an additional 90 to 100 PEP and Pre-K students as well. So currently PEP and between Pre-K to 5 we have about 750, uh, but K-5 to 650. Oh, so right now you have 750, including PEP. And pre-K, yes. And pre-K. Uh, so, but the building after renovation is 702. So you still have 40-some students that you're looking to move in the future to um, Burtonsville. More than that. Yes. Yeah. Pre-K okay. and PEP program okay. students. Okay, thank you. All the pre-K. So they will still have to live with a few portables right after renovation. First. Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. So does the current renovation, you mentioned a couple of uh, additional, the community school, you mentioned a couple of things that were not uh, accommodated for in the current space. With the renovation, will you have room that you need? We saw <coughs> linkages. How about community schools? Does community schools have any space requirements that need to be met? Not specifically. What we're currently planning on doing, seeing as how we have seven kindergarten this year, next year we're going to six. We're going to be reallocating one of those current classroom spaces to create a parent community room uh, for both our parent community coordinators and our community school liaison to work together within that space to also have a bigger room for our school pantry as well. Okay. I have one follow-up question. Um, do you have wellness space in here? Will you have space for that? Yes. Yeah, so last year, uh, we utilized some of our Title I funding. We created what we call a peace and calm room. Mm -hmm. um, it's right um, when you pass our guidance counselor's offices and pass our, and pass, um, our parent community coordinators. That is our peace and calm room that we have designed that as a wellness space okay. uh, for both students and staff. Okay. And is this a, like a courtyard space right in here? A white square. There's this white spot here. Like I'm on the proposed site on page 5A. It looks like the gymnasium. Is it? Mm -hmm. I'm it trying like to figure piano. out, do they have any kind of, you know, courtyard space where the kids go out and do stuff that they do at a lot of the we other schools? We do not have a courtyard schools. space, no. Is there any potential for any of that so that they can have a little area? I was at um, Georgian Forest, and they have a nice little area that in the middle that the kids can go out in. Is there any potential for that? So in the middle, our building, I don't believe, is configured for tip. that possibility. Okay. However, when MCPS was generous to construct our new play area on the lower field that was mentioned earlier, because our current blacktop has 10 portables on there, okay. if this project goes through and we get the pre-existing blacktop back, there is the possibility of being creative with that space okay. outside for additional outdoor space. Okay. I, I, I guess it's down here. So I don't know. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? So if that existing blacktop space um, has potential, then um, I would like you to look at if that can be converted to a friendly place for kindergarten or lower grade to use. That would be amazing. 
So the current portables, if you look um, where it says restore existing asphalt play on the side uh, on the side closest to this side of the building, that's where our original six portables were, and the side closer to the, where the parking lot is is where our newest four portables are. The intention is to take out the oldest portables under this project. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right, so we have a, um, need a motion and a second to move this forward. I was waiting to ask a question about this, so go ahead. You make the motion. Are you going to do it? No, you get, then she'll call for a question. Okay. So move. Second. Any further discussion? I have a question. Um, <laughs> I don't, I'm not prepared to move this forward unless I get some information on the questions I asked about the bathrooms and um, was that all? The bed, yeah, in the play area. Get some information on cost and what that would look like if we could do that. Because it seems to me that, um, and I'll just be honest, and you can write to me all you want. It short changes us in some ways, and you know when we're renovating schools, we might as well renovate them all up to the same standard and I'm not seeing that this is being brought up to the same standard as other schools have been brought up to. Uh, so. I, I also would like to see though um, if we add more things that means a, a bigger disruption for the school operation because now we will look into the kindergarten wing that we were not going to touch and the timeline of the project might be uh, impacted. Delayed. Yeah, it might be delayed. Dr. McKnight? So I would propose that if there are some reservations, you had questions around cost and other questions that could impact the timeline of the project, we could have the team go back and look at that, bring it back to the board so that you can understand those pieces before voting on a final resolution. And we can, um, yeah, if it, if it fits the agenda, we can bring it back on June 2nd, so not too much time is wasted in case. I'm sorry. Did I say second? June 6th. Um, so that we don't get too far behind um, and it able to communicate with the school and Mr. Principal Opsgard and can communicate with this community, you know, if, if, if in fact there will be something changing with the timeline based on that discussion. So we should come back to the next board meeting. So we have a motion and a second. What's there to do? I guess vote against it. Yeah. All in favor, raise your hands. I don't know if you have to vote. You if the motion's on the floor, it's dis being discussed. You can just move to table it, I think. Yeah, I'm table, I'm moving to table it, yeah. You don't need to move to table it. You can just table it. Yeah, but if the, the sitting motion is to approve the plan, you can table or postpone a vote on that. Postpone, yeah. Mm -hmm. I moved to table it. <laughs> I second that. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous with those present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and again, congratulations to uh, Greencastle on just uh, a long-awaited journey of some uh, updates. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you. Okay, let's move on to 11 consent items. Uh, do it, uh, board members have any consent items that they would like to pull? Seeing none, can I get a motion to move the consent items in block? So move. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous with those present. Uh, moving on to agenda item number 12, we can I get a motion to move 12.1 uh, and 12.2 in block? So move. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. Ms. Yang, are you, uh, Ms. Yang, Ms. Rhode Island, are you voting? That's unanimous with those present. New business item we did already. Uh, number 13 is for informational purposes only. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous with those present. 
We are adjourned.